Chapter 461 The Dark Knight Strikes In a distant corner of the battlefield, a silent form was lurking in the shadows. It had watched the events play out with an impassive expression, from the grand melee between the players and the void monsters, to the heroic charge of the core members of Umbra versus the rank two void monsters. The silent form had grimaced when the core members had come forward, as many old memories had flashed through its head, distracting and tormenting it, especially since those had not been its own memories, but of another just like him. For a split second, the quarantine zone that silent form had created for itself to trick the special senses of Eva had trembled and had almost come apart. However, its mind had quickly been stabilized by an external force. Not understanding who it was that had lent it help, the silent form had subdued its confusion before slowly moving towards Eva. Before he had the chance to act, though, the Armageddon Fitter Cleric had summoned landed with fury upon the zone, and even Eva and the Rank Three monsters had been forced to flee. This silent form quickly dispelled its defense and created an area of destruction energy around it. Its barrier had disintegrated everything that came into touch with it, leaving the existence below unscathed. However, its form now revealed, one should have been able to recognize that the one that had been sneaking through a veil of cordoned space was actually the Dark Knight. The first clone of Draco, and the second clone of Lucifer. Suddenly it all made sense. The reason why this world event had unexpectedly risen in difficulty was indeed because someone had expanded upon the slight crack Draco had made to the fabric of reality that led to the abyss. This had been the Dark Knight himself, in his dragon form no less. He had used destruction energy to rip the hole as wide as he could before he had been blasted away. In fact, the Dark Knight had only hoped for a bevy of Rank II Void monsters to distract Eva for a little while. He had never expected Rank III Void Devourers to use that chance to come out and play. However, he had lucked out by gaining the assistance of those ten monsters in distracting Eva. He had been convinced that it would be almost impossible for Eva to be killed by them, but he just needed her attention gone for a split second. In truth, he had been quite conflicted about his plans. Many things had seemed out of place to him. For example, why had he seen Draco and Eva together in perfect harmony, despite what she did to him? Why was Eva the co-founder of Umbra and not the leader of Darkrow like in those memories? When he had asked himself the first question, a voice had whispered into his mind that the memories he had seen were of the future, and only he could prevent Draco from suffering such a horrible fate. This had calmed the Dark Knight down for a while longer, until he had asked the second question, which still contradicted his memories. Once more, that voice had guided him, by explaining that what he remembered was jumbled up and of a similar but different timeline. The Dark Knight had been largely silent, but had decided to do some investigations of his own. However, he failed to remember what had happened at that time only remembering that it somehow had fed the crazed idea running through his head that he had to kill her. This had been around the time he had created the bigger hole in the tear on space. After he had been blasted away, he had regained his senses and had realized that there was something horribly wrong with the proceedings. However, his questions had been suppressed and his mind had been kept on a leash by something or someone he could neither see nor ever hope to go against. He had become like a drunk person being led to their car by a friend. The wasted person might recognize that the friend was leading them astray and would question it, but some soft reassurances would easily get the drunk person to become obedient and follow along. Since then, the Dark Knight had been half asleep and Hal, F aware of what had been going on around him. His body had moved to perform actions according to planned out scenarios, but his mind had sluggishly questioned everything. This had led to great resistance within him. He might be a clone, but he was still related to Lucifer and Draco, meaning that he would never settle for being controlled by another. Alas, it had been futile. As such, the Dark Knight had single-mindlessly followed through his directives to quell Eva as cleanly as possible without even considering the aftermath of it. Like a suicide bomber wearing a vest of C4, the Dark Knight had entered this battle in a way that suggested he didn't plan to come out of it 
after achieving his goal. After Armageddon came to pass, the Dark Knight struggled to re-enter his quarantine zone due to the amount of energy he had spent. However, a beautiful white light encompassed his form, wrapping around him gently and smoothly. This allowed the Dark Knight to re-enter a form of impalpability so solid that no person below divinity could spot him, for his current state was bestowed upon him by a divinity. System to Player Announcement You have been blessed with a veil of impenetrability from the goddess Sunna. You are completely undetectable to all species below the divine rank except for those bonded with the void. Note, goddess Sunna included a message in your blessing. Take down that wretched whore and destroy her immortal spirit, then I shall grant you any wish you so desire. The Dark Knight's conflicted feelings bled away. If a deity of this world could specifically call Eva a wretched whore, then didn't that mean that her infidelity did not start as late as his memories in this timeline? Could it be that the voice was right? After all, true gods could see everything on the main plane. For one to specifically assist him in vanquishing her, it had to mean that Eva must have done some great evil. To even make a promise like this, showed that Suna was willing to pay any price to see Eva extinguished. This train of logic reassured the Dark Knight that he wasn't exactly doing the wrong thing and might even do society a favor. As such, the Dark Knight reached a strange state where his mind and body were finally connected. The mysterious entity controlling his mind no longer needed to force him to do the job. The Dark Knight quickly spotted Eva, who came out from her underground hiding place and slowly approached her, but stopped halfway when he saw that she converged all the players around her. After a short wait, it seemed like they had reached some sort of consensus. They executed a beautiful sequence of skills that incapacitated all their foes and began a heavy bombardment that defied all reason. The Dark Knight was greatly stunned by their prowess, which was a far cry from his memories, especially for all the core members, some of whom didn't even exist in his memories. However, he quickly focused and got back to his task at hand, vanquishing Eva. He had to be smart about it, because once Eva got a whiff of him, he would fail, and he somehow knew that the stars would never align themselves in a similar way to give him another chance. In fact, he was certain that he would be the one extinguished from the world permanently, no matter the outcome. As such, he had to make his sacrifice count and execute everything perfectly. With this blessing from that strange goddess, he certainly would be able to get into place with ease. Everything would depend on the effectiveness of his plan. With that in mind, the Dark Knight got close to where Eva stood with the other three beauties nearby. He then plunged his hand into his chest and silently screamed as he pulled out a strangely shaped scale. It was similar to the one Draco had over his heart, the same shape and all, only that this one was slightly silver in color. It was his reverse scale. To tear off his reverse scale, the Dark Knight truly did not plan to live after this. If there had still been a sliver of a chance that he might survive, perhaps getting rescued be, I the goddess who had helped him out, he had just extinguished that possibility. No dragon could survive without their reverse scale, no matter who. In that same sense, the majority of a dragon's essence and power was contained in their reverse scale. After removing his reverse scale, the Dark Knight slotted it on his broadsword. Immediately, the weapon glowed with a bright light that was suppressed by the cover granted to him, but its sheer power made him waver. This was when Essence Stalker, in his void dragon form, sensed some weird undulations of space behind him. It was similar to when he had been in the ancestral dragon city, and had encountered an ancient bone dragon that had been blessed by a true god from the old era. No, Essence and Fitter had not won that battle, but it had been a valuable lesson teaching Essence a lot about the power of true gods and dragons. He felt that this undulation was similar to that circumstance, but he wasn't sure. He would have brushed it off if not for where the undulations occurred. It was right behind Eva's location. With a roar, Essence Stalker shot an orb of void toward that location to hold the enemy back while he rushed over. He shouted at the top of his lungs, Big Sis Eva, look out! Eva immediately understood what Essence Stalker was trying to convey by reading his mind and quickly activated her true void form. 
However, the transformations required some time to activate, and the Dark Knight had already begun to move the moment he had slotted his reverse scale. Essence and Eva had discovered him far too late to change anything. The Dark Knight suddenly appeared in plain view behind Eva, shocking the three NPC beauties beside her, as well as many core members who had shifted their attention towards her following Essence's cry. In that split second, as everyone confusedly watched on as Eva was impaled on the blade of the Dark Knight, it was as if time had come to a stop. Many wore disbelieving expressions, seeing Eva spit blood from the clearly fatal wound dealt to her that had cancelled her transformation. But if it was just this, Eva would have been able to retaliate. The Dark Knight also knew this, so he had channeled all the energy contained in his reverse scale to fuel his destruction energy, as the black miasma that usually meant that destruction energy was present emerged like flames and covered Eva's entire body. Eva originally planned to retaliate, but paused when she saw an emergency summon from her pod and chose to exit the game immediately. At that same moment that she left, though, the flame-like destruction energy had burned her player character to nothing, virtually erasing her existence from Boundless permanently. Right as the Dark Knight was about to let out a sigh of relief, he heard a scream fueled by hatred and anger and turned to see three supremely beautiful women gazing at him with such malevolence that even he shook. Eva pulled her hands off Draco's temple and sighed with a bit of fatigue. She sipped her drink lightly while Draco's expression changed many times as he parsed the information that had flooded his mind. Eventually, his lips twitched. I would never have been able to imagine that your mind reading would become so powerful in such a small amount of time. You really managed to filch that much from the mind of the Dark Knight in that one split second he had shown himself? Damn, those eyes of Kalo are useless compared to you. Eva chuckled smugly. Well, they weren't made for that purpose, so it's understandable. Draco gave her the side eye. Who could not hear the hidden boast in her tone? This celestial beauty of mine, she's really becoming a shameless crook by the day. Sniff, I'm so proud. Draco passed a hand through his hair. But still, despite going against you, I can't help but feel bad for the Dark Knight. Eva smirked. Heh <laughs> heh, let me guess, it's because of that, right? Draco nodded with a bitter smile. That Dark Knight fellow was ready to die, thinking he would vanquish you. Yet here you're with me. Fine eh? and dandy. Draco's face became even stranger at this point. He had the look of an older brother who watched his younger brother make a fool of himself by asking out the school's prettiest girl to prom when he himself was just a five-tenths. All his willingness to sacrifice himself, yet his plan was destined to fail if I hadn't interfered anyway, because after the last time we shared our bloodlines, you became immune to destruction energy. Chapter 462, The Next Step Draco then stared at Eva silently. The celestial beauty just sipped on her milkshake lightly and chewed a bit on the croissants and cakes laid before her, all the while intentionally avoiding eye contact from Draco. Eventually, Draco brought up the elephant in the room. Beauty Eva, lovely Eva, sweet Eva, amazing Eva, Belle Eva. Eva tore her eyes away from her plate and gazed at Draco with an innocent expression, her mouth still chewing some of the chocolate croissants nonchalantly. Yes, dear? Draco's lips twitched. He brought up two fingers and pointed at the first one. First, are we going to talk about those positions you were practicing? Eva blinked with surprise. Why? What positions are you talking about? Draco's face became black. He lightly smacked the table as his temples bulged. That's exactly what I want to know. The ones you learned from Amaterasu? You know, the ones that almost sent Lucifer to Euphoria Heaven. My darling soulmate, how could you be so cruel as to block the specific poses from the recollection, but let me know they exist? Eva's cute and innocent visage morphed into a cruel one reminiscent of riveting night as she smirked widely. Hey, hey, just something to tease you for abandoning me for so long. Draco's anger bled away as his training from sublime notion emerged in his mind. It seemed like he had hit a crossroads, and his next actions would decide whether he laid a positive flag or a negative one. As such, he wore a grudging smile and sighed. You're right. Going on that unique quest and staying away from you for so long is unforgivable. 
That's why I wanted to spend some time with you now, to see how my soulmate is doing and help her relieve some of the piled up stress. Eva sniffed. Damn, I forgot that Shorty had taught you how to swoon a maiden's heart. I accept my loss this time. Draco snickered meanly. Heh. But seriously, I can't wait for that bloody unique quest to come to an end. Now that I've seen the state of things out there, I really can't wait to distribute all the skills I've learned in the midst of the unique quest to see our guild soar to even greater heights. Before Eva could lead the conversation away, Draco pointed to his second finger. And that brings me to the more important matter. Draco coughed. Divine Mistress Eva, Celestial Maiden of all deities. Oh, beauty who shines so bright that even the stars in the night sky are jealous. May I ask why you're happily snacking here with me, while every single guild member of ours believes you've just been erased from the game, at a time when our people are left to fight the leftover rank 3 void devourers on their own without you at the helm no less. Eva nearly choked at this sudden accusation and had to quickly sip her drink to clear her throat. She had the decency to be ashamed, but only slightly. Well, I saw that you were calling and thought that it'd be nice if we could spend some quality time together. Draco was left speechless, but decided to drop the matter here. Even if he rushed her back, due to the time dilation, about 40 minutes had already passed in the game for the 10 minutes they had enjoyed in the Sunbar Cafe. Not to mention, it had taken some time to arrive here via car and would also take the same amount of time to drive back. He also couldn't leave his unique quest to help, so it would be better if he just spent his time with Eva and pretended like there wasn't any problem at hand. The evil duo enjoyed their time together, May chatting about many things while trying out many of the pastries they served, Eva a lot more due to her pregnancy. Afterward, they paid the bill and headed over to the castle to re-enter the game. On his way inside, he saw that some of the Sanguigno brothers who had left the game, most likely because the allotted time on their Virtua helmet had run out, were chatting animatedly about something. He could sense that their emotions were roiling with excitement and glee. Draco turned to Eva and she explained, Their minds are screaming about, T how much of a haul they are going to make today by raiding a rival gang's base within the city that is neither affiliated with supernatural or superhuman. Apparently, those guys have a huge cache of illegal weapons that could be used to restock our armory. Draco nodded in understanding. The Sanguino brothers were mostly known for their exemplary discipline, low numbers, and high skill. Also, they usually used military-grade tech and weapons for their assaults and defenses. Getting a boon of such weapons would definitely excite a group like this. Draco was not really interested in gang, mafia stuff anymore after learning about supernatural and superhuman. How could being a mobster be more exciting compared to being stuck between a war between science and the abnormal? This was the stuff from some lonely young ADU writer who wrote teenage hormone-fueled stories for a living. Draco entered his pod after bathing with Eva. She also entered hers around the same time and they both logged in together to see different scenes. On Eva's side, she came to find that the battle was still ongoing, but on its last legs. The allied army of players had been thinned down to just about 50 fellows, most of the core members of the four guilds. All of Umbra's core members had survived, including Zane, Hikari, and Roma. Gentle Flower, Yui, and Noble Soul had also not perished yet, along with their vice guildmasters. Surprisingly, Joker and Happy Scholar had also made the cut, although they also represented the last of their respective guilds. Out of the formerly ten Void Devourers, only three remained. The one controlled by Loving Ant was currently acting as a tank to hold down the ferocious and corrosive attacks of another Void Devourer, while Uno single-handedly held down the last. The fighting between the two Void Devourers looked like a slugfest between boxers, both of them exchanging blow for blow. However, the one on Umbra's side had almost full HP while its opponent was hovering around 43%. The one Uno was holding was still at 65% HP and had become the main target of the remaining players, solely because Uno was having a tough time managing it. If it wasn't for his legendary class's passive that buffed him stupidly and Hikari's non-stop heals, he would have died many times over. However, the moment Eva made an appearance, 
the whole area became deathly silent as all eyes landed on her. A myriad of emotions was displayed on those faces, from shock to excitement to disbelief. The sheer cacophony of thoughts rapidly firing through their minds gave Umbra's vice guildmaster a headache, so she turned off her bloodline's psychic abilities. For that matter, Eva quickly changed into her goddess form since she wanted to end the battle quickly. System to player announcement. You have transformed into your true goddess form. This is a fundamental change and your attributes, as well as your skills, have been swapped for racial ones only. Please check your status page for the changes. System to player announcement. Your class has been detected to be divine. Attributes will not be reallocated, but additional attributes will be applied for the duration of the transformation. Your equipment and class skills are blocked, but divine skills can be used in your true form. Name. Riveting Knight, Rank 2 Divine Goddess, Star, 100, Dex, 100, End, 100, Id, Int, 500, Spar, 100, Cha, 200, Elf, 100, Combat Skills, Divine Curse, Divine Following, Divine Blessing, Goddess Wrath, Angel Army, Endless Mirage, Non-Combat Skills, Celestial's Dignity, Rank 2, Element Regulation, Supreme Telepathy, Supreme Menticide, Supreme Channeling, Supreme Projection, Supreme Precognition, Supreme Retrocognition. Eva didn't waste time and immediately used her special buff skill that was broken beyond human understanding. Divine Blessing One. Immediately, a white light covered the bodies of all 50 people remaining, and they roared regardless of gender due to the sheer power flowing through them. Yes, even the cute sublime notion, fire and ice twins, as well as W, arm, spring roared, well, more like meowed, in response to this. Eva then focused and used Goddess Wrath One, while the 50 players raged and went berserk on the remaining two Void Devourers, the sky opened once again to drop mind-numbing amounts of light beams. They continually struck everywhere within the area zone, reducing the already ruined wasteland into a world of barrenness, except where her allies stood, of course. Eva then pointed and summoned her Angel Army 1. From the same heavens, a flood of holy and beautiful angels manifested. They were of different types, the Seraphim, and cherubim, the Valkyries, and the Inquisitors of Heaven. What was not different about them was their power. The moment they appeared, they followed Eva's mental command to destroy her two Void Devourers, and their damage output was 100x higher than the buffed 50 players. Eva had only one minute in this form, but the combination of her Goddess Wrath, Divine Blessing, and Angel Army made it such that the two opposing Void Devourers did not last more than 20 seconds overall. This left the players utterly speechless as fanfare played in their ears, and the system began rolling out announcement after announcement without fail. All of them turned to face the floating celestial maiden in her Amaterasu form, and no matter who they were, they felt their hearts trembling with awe. Everyone except local lord, of course, who could not see anything but the glowing aura from Eva's body. This frustrated him to no end, but what could he do about it? Eva collected the three beauties into the mansion's super mini small world and landed on the ground. She saw the body of the Dark Knight nearby, and his current state was so gruesome that she grimaced. Roma and Zane had certainly brutally tortured him in their fury, and he had only been kept alive by Hikari's healing. To even get Hikari to participate in such cruelty was testimony that they had seriously been infuriated beyond reason. However, they had clearly stopped at a point and had left the fellow hanging by a thread. It was understandable seeing that at some point the Dark Knight had lost his, only to reveal that hidden underneath it was Draco's exact face, except that his hair wasn't white and his eyes weren't red. To see that the one who had destroyed Eva, their big sis, and whom they had brutally tortured, wear the same face as their beloved, as Eva's soulmate. That must have messed them up far more than anything they'd ever experienced to date. That was why Eva had ended the battle quickly, and collected them into the world before they could say anything, as she personally owed them an explanation for everything that happened. For now, though, she had to deal with the aftermath of this battle. She had originally planned to wait on using her true forms until there were like 20 or so people left from Umbra, so she could limit those who would benefit from the AI's absurd rewards. But 50 appeared like a reasonably okay number. 
especially since most of Umbra's core members had been nearing the rank 2 ceiling anyway. Now that everything was settled, Eva came out of her goddess form and checked out the various system prompts before her slowly, her expression warping the more she read. Draco appeared in the bedroom of Evergreen Manor with a smile on his face. His long seclusion while honing his trade skills had built up a lot of stress, but spending time with Eva, albeit shorter than he might have liked, had blown all of that away. Now, he felt ready to go on. First things first, he summoned Hoover. The Goatman butler rushed to his side and bowed lowly. Lord Draco, what is your command? Draco smiled at this extremely handy and useful butler, then asked. Has the competition begun yet? Hoover's face displayed a strange expression. No, sir. After you came out of seclusion, only about three hours have passed and nothing has changed since then. Draco nodded but sighed internally. He had actually hoped that the AI might try to play a trick while he was away and start the competit Ion out of nowhere, but it seemed no such nonsense would be occurring. Draco passed a hand through his hair and said, Okay, please prepare materials for these trade skills. Draco proceeded to name the trade skills, making Hoover's eyes widen due to their rarity and potency. Once Hoover left, Draco took out the trade skill books for the choices he had made while inside the trade skill library, inspecting them for one last time before finally learning them. Angel Army, Active Skill Effect, Summon an army of beautiful angels to battle your foes. Duration same as transformation, cooldown, none. Goddess Wrath, Active Skill Effect, Call down a hail of fury on all enemies that dare to defile the goddess majesty. This deals 1,000% random damage to an area zone. Duration, same as transformation. Cooldown, none. Divine Blessing, active skill effect. Grant every ally within range infinite stamina, mana, and complete invulnerability. Duration, same as transformation. Cooldown, none. Chapter 463, Privateering 1. Dungeon Creator, legendary trade skill effect. Learn how to draft and establish dungeons of all types and sizes. Skill Fusion. Legendary Trade Skill Effect. Learn how to take two different skills and combine them to produce something unique. Simple descriptions, but their utility was so great for a player that it made Draco shiver with delight. Words could not describe the amount of self-patience he had had to muster all this while to not dive into these two trade skills, instead focusing on leveling up the ones he already had. As such, he had spent six months inside the unique quest on blacksmithing, alchemy, magical engineering, and scrivener. He had reached the Grandmaster rank in the first two and the Expert rank in the latter two. Now, it was time to focus on the three trade skills he had purposefully neglected so far, privateering, dungeon creation, and skill fusion. Seeing as it was the only one he actually knew about from the previous timeline, albeit in its weaker form, Draco chose to start with privateering. This was a trade skill that allowed a player to build ships and simultaneously navigate the treacherous waters of Boundless with relative ease. Basically, it was a combination of shipbuilding, navigation, sailing, and chartering. Any person who had this trade skill could build his own ship, captain it, and navigate it all at once. Naturally, one wouldn't be limited to just one ship and given enough resources, one could charter their own armada, but before he could be off atop the seas, he would need a semi-decent crew first. The least developed areas of Boundless had always been the vast oceans. Still, since the sea zones were more than three times harder to traverse through than their counterparts, the field zones, it only stood the reason that following the system's golden rule, the rewards had to be worth it. Poseidon and other water-based gods had control over these locations, but clearly, as there existed unmapped zones, it meant that there were should be completely uncharted and unclaimed oceans out there. The idea had thrilled Draco, which was why he had kept the privateering trade skill close to himself until he found the perfect person to wield it, which luckily turned out to be himself. With it, he could conquer unmapped oceans with Eva and spread out his base of influence. Draco had largely known about the existence of unmapped zones, but like everyone else, he hadn't dared to enter due to his weakness. Eva only got to Shinoka by sheer chance, and after seeing how it functioned through her eyes, Draco couldn't wait until he found other unmapped continents. 
Who knew what bounties such places could hold? Could it be possible for such zundant divine items, or even origin items? It wasn't impossible. Resources that were allowed to develop for hundreds of thousands of years untouched by humans or other sapient races would grow endlessly. Whatever the case, the prerequisite was for him to have a suitable means of travel. Luxia was fine and all, but they would be cutting out a lot of fun, adventure, and resources by using her. Slowly traveling over the seas while culling monsters and discovering rich isles was important. Even more so was developing a trade sea road that had to be cleared for others to pass. Otherwise, how could they turn it into a base and link it with other Umbra-controlled zones? If they used Luxia all the time, they could only end up like Eva's visit to Shinoka, where it was just that, a visit. She obviously couldn't spend all her time going up and down from Shinoka, ferrying goods. It was severely counterintuitive and wasteful, so privateering was the perfect solution. Draco activated the trade skill and was surprised to find himself in a small captain's cabin. The floor was made of polished wood, cut and laid in slabs, with a light brown wall and ceiling made of plaster. There were also many decorations, including portraits of S-sexy mermaids, a trident, a small sculpture of a majestic ship, two crossed scimitars on the wall, Lel among others. It was rather opulent and extremely aesthetic. It made Draco feel like he had jumped from a Western fantasy game to a seafaring simulator. Alas, his excitement quickly died down when he saw the familiar form of Satine bobbing over. Realizing he'd be unable to escape the Yandere orb and her family, he cut out her repetitive greeting and inquired upon the ins and outs of this particular trade skill. This is your personal cabin, the area where you can design your ships and connect with your crew to give orders. While on the sea, you can overlay the personal cabin over the captain's cabin of the ship and monitor as well as control the entire ship directly. Satine explained neutrally. Draco rubbed his chin in interest. What a versatile trade skill. It would truly be useful when on the sea, for Esh Ips could easily build up damage and wear in unknown places that would be too late to find by the time problem struck. With this, all he would need to mutter was trace, on, and he would be able to see every little detail of the ship. However, Draco was more interested in the first part. How can the personal cabin assist me in building a ship? Draco asked with interest. Satine lowered herself to the desk in front of Draco, shining her light on a giant cartographer's map. Here, you can access the map of the world you have explored and know about, as well as manage all trade and sea routes. She then shifted her light to a bunch of books on the same table. You can access your roster to control your crew, see who is who, and who is doing what. Her light went on to a small figurine of a ship that looked bland. When activated in a ship, this figurine will morph into the style of the ship itself, and you will be able to control and monitor the entire vessel with it. Finally, Satine shone her light on a small open notebook on the forefront of the large table, right before the captain's chair. And this personal workbook will allow you to access ship designs and learn how to craft them in detail, for a price. Draco smacked his lips knowingly. Heck, had there been no price, he'd have been even more worried, to be honest. He walked over to the desk and sat in the comfortable executive chair meant for a captain. He aimlessly spun around in it for a bit, before focusing on the workbook before him. Once he did, similar to a projection from a hollow watch, a screen came up before him showing a niche storefront. The store in truth was just a large wooden shelf with small figurines of ships labeled in each column. Draco scanned them, seeing their names and prices, before nodding his head. Like magical engineering, he could only learn designs at his current rank, so as an amateur, there were five of them for him to choose from. The other rows had the motifs of books, and it seemed like they contained basic knowledge about shipbuilding and seafaring in general for the common rank. Also, there were scroll-like icons that depicted contracts. Draco checked and saw that they were contracts for professional common rank crewmates and assistant shipbuilders who would work for him but their pay was steep. The cheapest and most unskilled took a minimum of 10,000 platinum per week as wages. To Draco, this wasn't much, but was he the only person to ever lay hands on this trade skill? 
Was every privateer a filthy rich fellow who could afford to throw platinum about? No. Even in the old era, such wages were steep as hell, much less in the current one. Most would likely either do it themselves or hire local but cheap builders to do the job for wages in silver at the most, with many workers taking bronze coins home a week. Of course, the quality differed greatly. Those hired through this store could work in tandem with the system trade skill to bring the best results and effects to bear. They could enchant each part of the ship while building, add any form of aesthetics while compensating for the entire design, they would never make any mistakes and could correct any unseen flaws as they worked, along with a myriad of other R functions that became crazier the more expensive their wages. Well, one could see it like this. A privateer who cheaped out to hire external shipwrights was like a person adding a bunch of roadside mechanics to build a car for him, while the privateer who splurged on the internal shipwrights was like a person asking the people who built and designed supercars to make a car for him. Big difference there. Of course, since Draco could afford it, he bought all the contracts and paid their wages. Even though he was broken here, the personal cabin workstation, etc., from the legendary trade skills were their own thing and didn't care about whether one was in a unique quest or not. As such, as Umbra's guildmaster Draco simply linked the income source to his guild's funds. As for the books on shipbuilding and the ship designs, they were naturally priced in ether crystals. Well, what did you expect at this point? Draco spent 35 low-grade ether crystals to buy out the books on shipbuilding, then put them aside. He also checked the contracts he paid for and found that they were like summoning contracts. He would have to leave the personal cabin and use them outside to get the people he hired to appear. This intrigued Draco, for if this trade skill was like magical engineering where its legacy was from the old era, would the people he hired be summoned from the old era? Was there time travel involved here? Well, for that particular issue, he could certainly find out more later on. Right now, Draco was more interested in checking out the exact details of the ship designs. While there were only five of them, each one contained so much information that it made his head spin, so he settled for a basic introduction in order to get used to what they could do. The Sailor's Rave, Design Durability, 100,000, 100,000 rank, common sail, 1.7, defense, 3 hunts, 3,000, M897 to 6,925, Cannon, effect, plen percent to cargo hold, plus 10% to crew stamina. Price, 34 low-grade ether crystals. The Princess's Delight, design durability, 80,000 to 80,000 rank, commonst 1.5, defense, 1,265 to 790, swivel, effect, plus 20% to sale price, plus 20% crew comfort, price 67 low-grade ether crystals. The King's Spear, design durability, 120,000, 20,000 rank, common speed, 1.2, defense, 500,000, in the 13, 786, 18, 953, cannon mortar, effect plus 10% to damage, plus 10% to defense, price 90 low-grade aether crystals. The Rapscallion's Glee, design durability, 30,000, 30,000 rank, common sale, sem 2.5, defense 70,000, deming, NAS snipers, effect plus 30% to acceleration, plus 2%, 76 low-grade ether crystals. The Mourner's Dirge, design durability, nat flak, rank common sale, ethereal, effect 50% to illusion, 50% to darkness, price 1 medium-grade ether crystal. Draco inspected them and nodded. The Sailor's Rave was a typical small merchant ship, built to last and to maximize the sailor's ability to carry goods from one dock to another. The Princess Delight was basically a medieval yacht. A fancy and aesthetically attractive boat meant for a princess to invite her girlfriends over and have stupid fun until they got tired. As such, it wasn't durable, fast, or strong in any way, just very pleasing to the eye. Draco had to admit, if he was invited to a party on a boat like this, he would definitely attend it with Eva in tow. The King's Spear was a warship at the basic level. Not as large as a galleon in the real world, but much faster and more durable. It also dealt a good amount of damage and should be the first choice for those who plan to conquer the sea, rather than traverse it. The Rapscallion's Glee was a small boat no bigger than a schooner, 
and its boasted extreme speed, maneuverability, and disguise. It was for smugglers who were ferrying high-quality cargo or fledgling pirates just starting out in the world. However, the one that left Draco dumbfounded was the Mourner's Dirge. Looking at the illustration of it, Hey boss, isn't this a fuck ghost ship? Chapter 464, Privateering 2 What truly baffled Draco was that for such a thing to be included in the list, there had to be a market for it. After all, the design for the Mourner's Dirge was the most expensive of the lot, meaning that it had to be the most valuable and likely the hardest to build. Draco's expression became incredibly strange when he thought about this trade skills practice during the old era. Was the system trying to tell him that there were freaks who actually paid privateers to build these for them? This just went to show how little he actually comprehended the magnitude of the old era. Across the mapped zones, the entire area had been chock full of so many different races that it had been a melting pot of epic proportions. Back then, even undead races had existed on the continents, with their very own designated cities and kingdoms. If their kind wanted to expand to the sea, they would definitely need a ship, and wouldn't the Mourner's Dirge have been perfect for them? Well, there was no such demand in this era, so Draco decided to only build one of the Mourner's Dirge for experience gain purposes. As for his main craft, he decided to create a mixture of the Sailor's Rave and the King's Spear. Both types of ships would be needed to simultaneously ferry goods and clear the waters of enemies at the early stage. But first, Draco would need to learn how to actually construct them. As he was absolutely clueless on how to build a ship, he sat down in the chair and began reading the books he had purchased hoping for the necessary guidance. Since they cost aether crystals, surely what they had to show him would not be meager, right? What slightly shocked Draco was that once he opened a book, he was pulled into its contents immediately. It was just like when he was learning designs in the Magical Engineering's personal workstation. He was once again put into a first-person view of someone else without being able to control the person's body, like a passenger in a 4D ride. As he was used to this, Draco settled down immediately and concentrated on what was going on around it. It seemed as if he was in the body of a young shipwright who was apprenticing under an old and quite irritable master. The master was currently taking his apprentice through the ropes of shipbuilding, teaching him how to measure the planks, the general structure of a ship, and the idea behind how a ship remained afloat. Draco was deathly silent throughout all of this, as he greedily absorbed the knowledge bestowed upon the young shipwright, who was currently ordered by his master to assist him in some basic tasks. Whenever Draco's host made a mistake, the master would grunt with displeasure and thwack the boy's head, pointing out what he did wrong, before telling him how to go about it correctly. The boy, who grumbled under his breath, didn't dare to talk back for fear of more physical punishment and quickly fixed his errors. Inside the boy's mind, Draco was trembling from excitement because these were the basic errors anyone would have made if they had only heard the master's lecture and went off on their own to try their hands at it. This tutorial of sorts not only gave a beginning privateer the raw knowledge, but also offered them some practical experience, especially on how to avoid making the basic mistakes they would have inevitably made. Draco couldn't help but fantasize about the sci-fi world at that moment. If he could find a trade skill there that alluded to mech building, AI programming, spaceship creation, he should be able to easily carry them to the real world as long as trade skills provided detailed tutorials like this, obviously for a price. Still, he brought his excited mind back to the present and continued experiencing the life of the young lad. After what felt like one month, the young fellow was noticeably far more adept in his art, and even the master was grunting in acknowledgement of that fact. His arms folded, and his expression saying, not bad, grudgingly. Of course, Draco had only been present D during the times the boy actually worked in the shipyard. Whenever the young shipwright and his master closed for the day, the scene would black out, resuming only when the duo began a new day in the work area. Still, after a month of non-stop practice and progress through the eyes of this fellow, Draco felt himself considerably well-versed in the basics of building a ship. However, he and the young shipwright 
had yet to actually assist in putting a ship together. In the final weeks, most of the fellow's duties had consisted of cutting slabs of wood, measuring their length, sanding and fitting them, and finally measuring their collective buoyancy when exposed to water. On the last day of the fellow's training, he finally was tasked with setting up the base of the ship by himself. As such, he spent the entire day building the ship's underside, from the bowsprit to the stem, to the keel, to the rudder and aft, all the way up to the poop. It was a small but sturdy outer shell of a ship, with absolutely nothing inside. However, one could say it contained the culmination of a young man's growth and effort over a long period of time, representing his change from a hapless apprentice to one who could stand side by side with his master. The easiest way to tell this was that the master himself was struggling to hide the smile that was forming on his face so that he could keep up his usual harsh expression. However, it ultimately failed when the young shipwright bundled over with excitement at his completed task. The master gave up and hugged the lad, whispering, I'm proud of you, boy. I might just make a professional out of you yet. The tutorial ended here, and Draco returned to his seat in the personal cabin. He shook his head and smiled. Even though he had been put under intense time dilation, he no longer felt it due to his superior mind and the pod. He put aside the first book, which had led him to the tutorial he just undertook, then grabbed the next one. This one took him to an academy of science, where a bunch of students were studying the science of ships. The tutorial lasted three months this time, a full semester, including exams. Luckily, the body Draco inhabited had been a serious student who had devoted his time to learning over partying, and Draco had once more soaked up everything. It had allowed Draco to learn about buoyancy, the required density of the ship's components against the density of water that allowed it to float, the reason why sails were needed for a boat to move, how a boat remained atop the water without capsizing, multiple ways to beat water resistance when sailing, and much more. Everything was theory, sure, but Draco understood that theory was just as important. The previous duo had mostly used guesswork and experience from years of building to do what they had done. Like most vocational skills, the average practitioner did not know the full science behind what was happening. They mostly gauged the right path through trial and error and following their professional sense to guide them. One needed to merge these two to get the best of both worlds. The student Draco had inhabited might understand everything about how a ship functioned, moved, and existed, but if stranded on an island with all necessary materials, he likely wouldn't be able to build for shit. Similarly, if you asked the master to explain how the ship he built would float scientifically, what water resistance was and what density was, he would stare at you blankly, not understanding what the hell you had smoked before coming to him. Scholar versus vocationist? Neither one. The two needed each other to succeed. The third book Draco opened transported him into the body of a master this time. He became the foreman of a fledgling shipbuilding yard that seemed to be up and coming. There were quite a few requests from various parties to build the ship, but the master left that to his other master-level shipwrights and their various apprentices. The foreman went to work on the biggest project that had been granted to the he, shipyard, a warship. This was something that they could not afford to botch, for the climb from making mere merchant ships to making warships was steep. It was like a new car manufacturer brand that mostly dealt with commercial cars being given a contract to produce their first supercar. It was not a simple jump. This would be their grand debut into a bigger world, and they needed to handle everything to perfection. Naturally, the foreman rallied his absolute best shipwrights, and together they toiled night and day. He first drafted the design in detail with his men, and they discussed and debated the science behind it. Draco, who had gone through the second book that had taught all of this, was easily able to follow along and appreciate the pure ingenuity of their design. It was clear that these fellows had all attended an academy of sorts to know this much. After they had debated long and hard and had fixed the design to perfection, they started putting it together, bit by bit. Draco could see the fluidity and professionalism in their actions, telling him that they were also like the master from the first book who had a wealth of hands-on experience. 
they measured everything by gut and hand, matching the design with perfect ease that stunned Draco silly. If the previous two books were like kindergarten-level stuff, then what these fellows were teaching him was high school-level stuff. Quickly, they put the entire warship together, but Draco already knew how to do this from the previous two books. He knew how to build a ship from scratch and even augment the design a bit. However, he became silent when he saw something he had not encountered in the previous two tutorials, which was the construction and placement of cannons, guns, and fortification. In other words, a ship's defenses. This part was extremely complex and required a lot of work, but Draco followed along diligently, commending these men greatly in his heart. He may not need to build ships in the real world, nor had he had much of an interest in them before today, but he could not help but respect the skills of these craftsmen. It was frankly a pleasure to watch them work. Draco also learned how to put up dual riggings and how weapons played a role in increasing a ship's weight, thereby lowering its speed and maneuverability. As such, the foreman had to take all of that into account when building the ship, otherwise its relative density to the water would see it sink on contact. Once this was done and the warship was completed, the foreman and his men feasted and partied for an entire night before presenting their creation to the crown prince, who had requisitioned it. The crown prince and his entourage inspected the ship as the foreman and co stood by nervously, but they were worried for naught. The crown prince was extremely satisfied, so much so that he even paid a little extra as a tip for their exemplary service. Surprisingly, the tutorial didn't end there. Three months later, the crown prince had won 15 battles with that single warship and brought it back for repairs. The foreman's shipyard had greatly expanded since then, but he personally saw to the crown prince's ship repairs. Before the tutorial came to an end, the crown prince, a typically handsome and heroic-looking fellow with blonde hair and blue eyes, patted the shoulder of the foreman and praised him. In our kingdom, your type of service is a treasure. As such, I hereby nominate you as royal shipwright. Do you accept? The foreman, emotional and moved, went on his knees and happily agreed. All his men roared with glee and excitement, for the foreman's glory was their own glory. The crown prince and his royal guard laughed and mingled with the shipwrights as they made merry throughout the night in celebration. Draco came out of this tutorial with another smile. Truly, if you dedicate yourself to your work and do it with total honesty as well as unambiguity, you will be rewarded by your own efforts. As pleased as Draco was for the foreman's happy ending, he had two more books to look through. Without wasting another moment, dove straight away into the next one to see what it had in store to teach him. Chapter 465, Privateering 3 The fourth book took Draco into the body of a female, though it was gender compensated by the AI and not of the human race. This time, he was a female dark elf that was training in a group. The goal of their lesson? to empower a ship post-construction with enchantments that increased its durability, speed, and power compared to those crafted by other shipwrights. In fact, this tribe of Dark Elves had pioneered this technique, though there was no mention about how their secret racial technique got into the privateer trade skill shop, though anyone with a brain could likely put two and two together. Whatever the case, Draco feigned ignorance and soaked up what he could. He was surprised to see that their method of enchanting ships was not too different from how he would enchant a weapon after smithing it. The most prominent change was the lack of a screen to prompt him whether he wanted to enchant the ship. This was a guess on his part as these elves weren't using the trade skill to do it, but rather that everything had to be done by hand. Most importantly though, the method of formulating enchantments was vastly different from those done for weapons. For weapons, the process was naming, power, and execution. Naming, where you named the item being enchanted in runes, power deciding the main element or property it was being infused with, and execution detailing how the enchantment would function. Here, though, there were five stages to a single enchantment. The materia, the chroma, the forma, the spiritua, and the meta. Draco felt it sounded unnecessarily fancy, so he immediately decided to rename them based on what they actually did. 
Elves were known for their penchant for unnecessary opulence when it came to cultural things, and although the Dark Elves were different from their surface cousins, some things remained the same. So he let the matter go for now, though it was quite annoying, to say the least. The materia was similar to naming. One used a rune to state the material the ship was made out of. Mu, for wooded ships, Jin for metal ones. The chroma was the purity of the enchantment. These runes were used to decide how to run the enchantment's energy cycle cleanly. The forma was the direct source of energy for the enchantment. Unlike weapon enchanting that nominally required soul stones, ship enchantments were like dragons, they could use external energy to fuel themselves. The spiritua was the brain of the enchantment. It controlled everything, from the extraction of energy to the storage and infusion, etc. The meta was similar to the execution section, where the actual effect of the enchantment is listed. Everything that came before is just to set up a foundation for this one to function properly. Draco was intrigued by their system of enchantment and had to admit that it was ingenious. If he had not seen it from their hands like this, he would never have developed such a system on his own despite being a Grandmaster Enchanter. It only took a moment for Draco to decide on the new names for the various sections. The materia he called base, the chroma he called purity, the forma he called source, the spiritua he called engine, the meta he called function. So base, purity, source, engine, function. Such a system sounded a lot better, more professional, and more mature than that fancy garbage, all offense towards Dark Elves intended. Draco soon completed the tutorial and spent some time in silence. There was a lot more for him to digest from the fourth book, but he decided to leave it for later eventually. He would naturally jump to shipbuilding after the next book, so he would be able to practice hands-on. As such, he opened the fifth book and was whisked away into whatever final vision awaited him. This time, Draco found himself in an engineer's shop. Similar to the first book, he occupied the mind of an apprentice learning from their master, though this time the content was far more direct and interesting. They were making weapons, cannons, swivel guns, mortar, s, and snipers even. What was doubly interesting was that these cannons were not your typical fare, but were also magical. This was because both master and apprentice were magical engineers. As for this lesson, Draco took it in with relish, for he had never used his magical engineering to craft something this large, and he had no idea if such designs were even available to him. So, one could say that this was definitely broadening the scope of his knowledge exponentially. In the third book, he had learned a bit about cannons and weaponry, but that only had to do with the idea of where to place them and how to gauge their positions in relation to functionality and weight, not how to make them. Draco noticed that the magical engineers used materials he knew of and even had in his inventory, making things simpler for him. Along with that, they also shockingly further used some basic enchantments on the cannons via the typical method. Draco was intrigued and interested in seeing these weapons in action, and as soon as the tutorial came to an end, he quickly put the books aside and exited the personal cabin. He noticed that he was standing silently in the middle of the workroom's super mini small world alone. To that side were Mjolnir and Perdidini, still working hard in mass producing some epic grade stuff for him. Nodding to his two slave Kush beloved items, Draco first took out the contracts he had purchased from the personal cabin and activated them all. With a poof, ten summoning circles appeared around him. From them, Ten men and women of different races and builds appeared before him. What made Draco frown, though, was that they looked more like puppets than actual people. Along with that, they did not even speak. They just stood up groggily and shook off their confusion before staring at Draco silently. For that matter, Draco noticed that a screen popped up before him that detailed the stats of each assistant, their abilities, and their current status. Huh, so it seemed he was wrong, and this was not time travel. Well, not overtly at least. These puppets were like androids if anything, and they seemed to be semi-sentient for the most part. Draco could immediately tell that they were shoddy clones of other people. In fact, his current theory was that these fellows were clones made of actual people from the old era, as the wages he paid had to go somewhere. It was likely a feature of the trade skill 
that allowed talented shipwrights among the lot to create replicas of themselves to work as assistants for others in exchange for funds. That was actually a sensible and worthwhile mechanic, as it would allow the poorer of the lot to acquire funding from somewhere without having the impede on their own time and duties. Draco didn't waste any more time speculating. He took out the materials for the cannons he had seen in the last tutorial and began putting them together. He selected two of the ten assistants that had high stats in cannon work and had them assist him. He was quickly shocked by their skill, speed, and efficiency. It was no different from hiring two of himself. This was definitely worth the price in platinum per week. As for the other assistants, since he paid them per week, it would be a shame to not make the most of them, so he assigned them to different tasks. Draco quickly realized the difference between himself and an average privateer. An average user of this trade skill would have to do everything on their own in the early stages until they made enough dough from selling their services that they could hire help one by one. However, a rich bitch like Draco was able to take the easy way out and had hired everyone he could so he could work on all parts at once. He was no different from the foreman in the third tutorial who had spent years building up his shipyard and crew from scratch. As such, he stopped being totally hands-on and adopted a more supervisory role. He commanded each of the puppets with his mind like a network instead of using verbal commands. Draco had taken a cue from Evev, A, and started applying his bloodline psychic abilities a bit more. He refrained from using telekinesis or telesthesia fully because, like Eva, he was certain that he could lose control and end up with something unpredictable. With Draco's Dark Angel inheritance 30% activated, it was the least controllable of the lot, no different from a nuke that was primed. If he jostled it too much in ignorance, it would explode. However, basic telepathy was easy enough for him, especially thanks to experiencing it firsthand through Eva. It burned twice as much energy for him compared to her, but he could still do it. Draco watched with a mixture of disbelief and defeat as the ten assistants quickly put together the first design he had chosen to work on, the Rapscallion's Glee. Draco intended to only make one of these for now, as the demand was likely low, and it was pointless anyway. He didn't need pirates among his members, because for pirates to function, they would need semi-stable waters with plenty of trade routes to plunder. As stated, the current sea was fatal after just a few miles from shore, so who exactly were they supposed to plunder? After it was done, Draco noticed that he received 50% trade skill XP for the first craft, which was a welcomed surprise. It was much more than magical engineering or Scrivener's first craft boost, which was just a measly 5%, but then the difficulty and time consumption was also of a different category altogether. Well, putting aside Draco having all the materials at his beck and call, having money to hire out the best help, and being situated in a super mini small world perfect for all forms of crafting, that is. When one thought about the suffering, sweat, and tears the average privateer must have vented in their early days compared to Draco's smooth sailing, one could only feel like taking a stick to bash the fellow's skull in. Draco moved on to the next design, which was the Princess Delight. Not only was this ship larger, but it was more complex and required a more direct touch due to the heavy emphasis on aesthetics. The Rapscallion's glee took only a day to make, while Draco had estimated the average time to be seven days for others, while the princess's delight took the group five days compared to the average of 35 days. Just having these ten assistants reduce the craft time by a factor of seven and reduce the difficulty to almost nothing as well. However, their wages were no joke, totaling 340,000 them a week for all of them. This was an amount that not even the former Hellscape and Dark Row put together could have afforded, not even if they had sold all of their assets. Just like any aspect of life, money could make everything smooth and easy, if you had a lot of it. Also, the degree of ease and freedom decided how much one would need to fork over. In this case, at the mere amateur rank, Draco had to give out just under 350k platinum a week to enjoy these cheat-like benefits. Even for him, this was steep. It was likely that Sublime Notion would jump in fear due to the sudden bills hitting her desk. Heck, 
Had they not acquired more land or gained the almighty money lover, Umbra wouldn't even make enough weekly to cover the cost. Even now, these contracts were draining Umbra cruelly, so Draco knew he couldn't keep it up forever. Draco also smiled bitterly when he realized that the system was cruel. By implementing such steep costs, people who intended to use this trade skill to make money would tough it out themselves and never use this method. How many Shep Ips could you even make a month, and how much could you sell them for to make up for these severe costs? As such, the only idiots, cuff, rich young masters, who would actually pay for such a thing, were people like Draco, who used the trade skill for themselves, to build a personal armada according to their own tastes, and for their own personal consumption. Chapter 466 It's time eventually, Draco's team completed the princess's delight and moved on to the mourner's dirge. He was left speechless when he found that the design was actually similar to a typical ship, but what gave it the aura and the looks was the enchantment used. It was complex and troubling. Even more so, the source rune stated that it drew from darkness energy. This was the first time for Draco to encounter something that absorbed anything other than worldly energy in order to fuel its processes. Even the rapscallion's glee and the princess's delight had both used worldly energy as a source, so the mourner's dirge stood out. Also, the function stage of the runes was so detailed and lengthy that Draco had to do it himself in order to save time, as he was the only grandmaster enchanter among them. After it was done, the mourner's dirge came to life and was completed. It had taken the group another seven days to achieve this, making Draco realize that he couldn't straight up build the armada of his dream while he was here. He was feeling more and more that his time was becoming limited, maybe because barely three months were left out of the one-year time limit he had for this unique quest. He couldn't afford to enter another seclusion to solely build ships. He wanted to also check out his dungeon creation and skill fusion trade skills, because both looked super interesting and useful. As such, Draco left the shipwright assistants in the work area, telling them to build one of the sailor's rave and the king's spear each. Since he had been the one to summon them, he would still get the entire experience without having to lift a single finger. In the meantime, he went to the trade skill library once again. Unfortunately, he couldn't draw any new trade skills for himself, so instead he opted to head towards the aisle for the techniques for privateering and see what he could learn for himself. Upon browsing, he noticed a few good legendary techniques and some unique designs for ships, though he kept to those at the common rank. Ian Waters' Sailing Technique Legendary Technique Effect This technique is estimated to increase the speed of sailing by 30%, the comfort of the journey by 15%, and reduce the consumption of stamina by 30% for all sailors. Description This technique utilizes a set of methods created by Ian Water, a well-known sea captain who had never failed a cargo run in his entire career. He propounded that sailing atop the sea is not a matter of spirit, but science and wisdom. As such, he left these special set of procedures to educate any young sailor on the maxims of water-based travel at the helm of a ship. Richter's Cannon Mastery Technique Legendary Technique Effect This technique is estimated to increase the damage of a ship by 20% during combat, the reload speed of the cannons by 75% and increased shot accuracy by 90%. Description This technique utilizes a set of methods created by Richter, an infamous sea lord who fancied the life of conflict and war. He usually utilized this technique for hunting down pirates and foul fellows atop the seas, but occasionally used it to battle navy ships out of boredom. These are a special set of procedures that can allow a ship's captain to mobilize his crew in such a way that their cannon work would be most efficient. Ship Speed Building for Professionals Technique Legendary Technique Effect This technique is estimated to increase the speed of ship construction by 70%, the quality of the final product by 15%, and reduces stamina consumption of shipwrights by 80%. Description This technique utilizes a set of methods created by the Seafarers Union, a collectivist group of sailors and shipwrights that sought to make sea life more streamlined and efficient. This technique propounds a special set of procedures to undertake when constructing a ship, 
preferably with the assistance of able-bodied assistant shipwrights, in order to shorten construction time while not only maintaining quality, but increasing it. Draco honed in on these three e-techniques because they had been the best of the lot and the most useful to him per se. One for how to sail, one for how to fight, and lastly one for how to build were. He also found a few techniques for navigation, but none had managed to catch his interest. It would be far more fun to explore randomly and expand upon a new route on his own. As for the extra common rank ship designs, he didn't inspect them in too much detail. Already dealing with the ones he had would take time, and he wasn't willing to spend that much time on it overall. He then left the privateering aisle and went over to the blacksmithing, alchemy, magical engineering, and scrivener aisles. The last time he was here, he had limited himself to the level he was at in all four of these trade skills in respect to designs and special methods. This time, he soaked up more and increased his wealth of knowledge up to his current rank. This was especially important for magical engineering and scrivener, whose levels he had jumped through during his seclusion. One could consider him doing this as semi-consolidating his current rank in the trade skills. He spent less than half a day in there, as there was not too much for him to catch up on in this sense. Once he exited the library, he moved over to the bathroom to clean himself with the help of one of his seated concubines, and then had a meal with the trio of Ophi, Hoover, and Doris. Natasha was still in her own seclusion, though Hoover reported that she appeared to be on the cusp of a breakthrough to a Grandmaster Cook, although the exact moment could be anything ranging from a day to over a month. This impressed Draco, and he wondered if the irritable birdwoman could actually do it. Whatever the case, he had his own issues to solve. After resting for a bit, he went over to the dwelling of Cheong Chi and Clarent to bully the two for a bit. By the time Draco left a few hours later, the duo were howling in pain and regret, wishing they had never encountered such a vile fellow. Alas, as soon as the one in charge was out of the room, the two of them didn't hesitate to make plans on how to get their revenge on this fellow. One would think that Draco's action would warn them about the consequences of such a futile attempt, yet those two were incorrigible. Feeling extremely satisfied, Draco returned to the workroom to see that work was underway on the sailor's rave. The foundations had already been laid out, and it only needed some more time for the rest to be put in place before the enchantments and whatnot would be added. Satisfied with this, Draco turned to Pear Dadany and Mjolnir who had just finished another batch. He checked their settings and thought for a little bit before changing what he had put there for the alchemy queue only. System to player announcement, set up a crafting queue for the Angel's Kiss Potion. 1. Autocraft, success rate 65%, amount 600, ETA 10 hours. 2. Batchcraft, success rate 32.5%, amount 600, ETA 10 hours. YN, system to player announcement set up a crafting queue for the Dragorugio set. 1 autocraft, success rate 65%, amount 700, ETA 70 hours. 2 batchcraft, success rate 32.5%, amount 770 hours, YN. As one could expect, he chose autocraft over batchcraft as usual. Draco even checked his inventory and found that there was quite a hefty amount of completed Dragorugio sets and enlightenment potions during his months-long seclusion. As for his ether crystals, it was best to drop the matter. Investigating exactly how many Draco had could make anyone spit three liters of blood in shock and indignation. Editor's note, for all intents and purposes, we will treat it as if he has an infinite amount unless explicitly stated otherwise. Once Draco sorted all these misc issues out, he smiled and moved towards the shipwright assistants in order to supervise them in their activities. However, before he could even take a step, a loud and indescribable voice spoke. It is once again that time. It is time for me to test my descendants as well, L as one worthy outsider to see who is worthy of my inheritance. A competition will be held in the core area, so all parties who wish to participate should be present there in twelve hours, or not at all. Once Draco heard this, his red eyes flashed with malicious intent and his lips curled up into a smirk. Finally, Event Zone Announcement all players, congratulations on completing Abyssal Invasion Emergency Quest. Time elapsed through 3127 assessment. 
SSS Plus Reward, 10,000 Reputation with Sturge Haven Kingdom, 20,000 Reputation with All Races, 8,000% Experience, 300,000 Gold, 7 Epic Treasure Chests. Event Zone Announcement. All players, congratulations on completing the Abyss World event. Time elapsed. 7 8 head 7 6 doors dine dot. Assessment S plus reward. 100 reputation with all world organizations. 1,000 reputation with the War Maniac Pavilion. 70,000 gold. 1 legendary treasure chest. Event zone announcement guild rankings have been calculated. 1. Umbra. 2. Kamisuo. 3. Desecrators. 4. Marin. 5. Myriad cards. 6. Lorebinders. The list of rewards will be privately shared with each guildmaster accordingly. Event Zone Announcement Individual Rankings have been calculated. 1. Fitter Cleric 2. Riveting Knight 3. Quiet Blade. Cobra 4. Slim Fatty 5. Jada and Jade 6. Loving Ant 7. El Westy Wench Rena 8. Rambunctious Buttlover 9. Essence Stalker 10. Tunder Power Rewards will be privately sent to each player accordingly. Event Zone Announcement Last Hit Bonus Awarded to Riveting Knight Rewards will be privately sent to the player. System to Player Announcement Player Riveting Knight, congratulations on placing second on the individual rankings. Rewards, 3 Legendary Treasure Chests, 10 Epic Treasure Chests, 50 Rare Treasure Chests, 100 Uncommon Treasure Chests, 5,000 Common Treasure Chests, 100,000 Gold. System to Guild Announcement. Guild Umbra, congratulations on placing first on the Guild Rankings. Rewards, 3 Divine Blessing Tokens, 10 Cassis Belly Wavement Scrolls, 10 Compulsory Muster Scrolls, 500 City Resource Packs, 2,000 Ether Crystals, 1,000,000 Platinum. Sturge Haven Kingdom Regional Announcement Players, Fitter Cleric, Riveting Knight, Quiet Blade, Cobra, Slim Fatty, Jada and Jade, Loving Aunt, El Lesty Wench, Rena, Rambunctious Buttlover, Essence Stalker, Tunder Power have ranked in the top 10 of the Abyss event. Cario Continent International Announcement, Players Fitter Cleric, Riveting Knight, Quiet Blade, Cobra, Slim Fatty, Jada and Jade, Loving Aunt, El Lusty Wench, Rena, Rambunctious Butt Lover, Essence Stalker, Tunder Power have ranked in the top 10 of the Abyss event. Boundless System-Wide Announcement Players Fitter Cleric, Riveting Knight, Quiet Blade Cobra, Slim Fatty, Jada and Jade, Loving Aunt, Lusty Wench, Rambunctious Butt Lover, Essence Stalker, Tunder Power have ranked in the top 10 of the Abyss event. Sturgehaven Kingdom Regional Announcement Guilds, Umbra, Kamisuo, Desecrators, Marin, Myriad Cards, and Lorebinders have ranked in the top 6 of the Abyss event. Cario Continent International Announcement Guilds, Umbra, Kamisuo, Desecrators, Marin, Myriad Cards, and Lorebinders have ranked in the top 6 of the Abyss event. Boundless System-Wide Announcement Guilds, Umbra, Kamisuo, Desecrators, Marin, Myriad cards and lore binders have ranked in the top six of the Abyss event. Just as Eva was trying to parse and break down all these announcements and screens before her, even more came on top, like a cascade of error windows. System to Player Announcement Goddess Sunna has declared a holy war on you. As two competing deities for the same attribute, you will have 30 years to gather followers of your own, paladins, clerics, and priests to fight on your behalf. The winner is granted the divine attribute, while the loser is stripped of all divinity. System to player announcement error. Detected that while player riveting knight has deific bloodline and special skills, player riveting knight neither has a divine source origin nor a divine rank. As such, the issuance of the holy war is voided, and the issuer pays a penalty of 5% of their assets and divine energy to the victimized party. System to player announcement. A message from Goddess Sunna. Impossible. You vile bitch. How dare you trick me. You are a mere mortal not worthy of divinity. System to player announcement. Goddess Aphrodite is speechless by the events in Sunna's behavior, but encourages you to climb the ranks. System to player announcement. The other true gods are gazing at this matter with amusement and mockery. System to player announcement. Fire god Flashflame has passed out from laughter. Eva's lips twitched. Truly, the jokes write themselves sometimes. Chapter 467. Rewards. One Eva rubbed her face with a sigh. She felt her hatred and anger towards Suna slowly bleed away. It wasn't that Eva had suddenly decided to forgive Suna's actions. No, she had just lost the energy to even be angry. At this point, 
anyone could tell that Suna was a colossal retard. Nothing she had said or done since she had broken ties with Eva had shown the least bit of common sense or even basic intelligence. She was mentally challenged. There were no two ways about it. No one could mount a proper defense for Suna against this claim. Even the other gods had been stunned and amused by her antics, finally realizing that they had been harboring an idiot all this time. For Eva to actively go about seeking revenge on a mentally retarded person for their actions would be demeaning to Eva and her intelligence. Of course, Suna still needed to be taught a lesson, else she would just continue being an annoying hindrance, but it was no longer a goal, just a passing thought. With that, Eva ignored the retarded sun goddess and focused on her own rewards. She was surrounded by the happy cheers of the other survivors who felt like they were on cloud nine. They had never expected to luck out like this and acquire such mind-boggling boons at all. Especially the likes of Joker and Happy Scholar, who were currently hugging each other and jumping up and down in joy. The emergency quest had given them a lot of rep points and 300,000 gold. Boss, not everyone was like Umbra with their own basic internal currency, which at the current point had the same value as a single platinum coin. 300,000 gold was a hefty sum and could be used for a great many things. Even Kamasuo and Ko, who had enjoyed many benefits from being Umbra's closest allies, felt like this much was a godsend, not to mention that this was the reward per player. Of course, for the core members of Umbra and to a lesser degree the expert players who had survived, this wasn't that much. They had more value in UPs than this reward, but well, it could be used to buy food for their dogs. The seven epic treasure chests were the true takeaway, though. Sure, there was only a 30% chance to get an epic item from within, and even that was dependent on the luck stat, but it was still great. At least, they had seven chances to try for an epic item. Even if they failed, that would be seven rare items for free for them to manage. Apart from disgusting fellows like Umbra's top brass who wore epic items like they were the new fashion, the rest mostly used rare stuff at the highest. Even Gentleflower, Noble Soul, and Yui had just a few epic items to their name, with the majority of their loadout being rare. With this, they could upgrade their equipment for sure. Then, there was the mind-boggling world event completion bonus. As Boundless was an incomparably cruel and unfair game, only those who had survived to the end for any event, usually the hardest part of it, would get the system rewards. The rest could only enjoy freshly cooked nothing for their efforts. If you didn't like it, get gud scrub and survive till the end next time. Funny enough, those cucks would always be present for every event due to the scenery and the small chance that they too could be the ones winning such absurd rewards as long as they managed to hide in a hole deep enough to survive. The rewards for the world event truly showed the reason why it had taken so long for it to begin and why despite millions of players participating, only 50 had been able to stay alive, which was a fluke due to the existence of Umbra. In fact, it wasn't calculated solely based on the performance during this battle, but everything that had occurred preceding it. This included the first guild war, the void infestation emergency quest, and even Draco using the Abyssal Key. Had he not used up the Abyssal Key, the rating would have been even higher and they would have gotten a lot more. While the 8,000% XP, 300k gold, and 7 epic treasure chests looked super sweet from the Abyssal Invasion Emergency event, the reward DS given from the world event were smaller but much more impactful. The two couldn't even be compared. 100 reputation with all world organizations might not seem like much, but Chief, you might be forgetting that the Church of Light was also a world organization the Mages Association, the Merchant Guild, and more. Reputation allowed one to access special resources or services from organizations or countries depending on the amount of reputation in total. Some even allowed you to spend reputation points for rare items or unique services. In the case of the former, you kept your reputation points but paid with something else, either platinum, rare items, or a specific token of sorts. And in the case of the latter, you just spend your reputation directly. Usually, when doing the latter, the item or service you would gain would be of a higher quality than the former. 
One should not forget that in the previous timeline, the top two players who had low-quality divine items had gotten them by exchanging 70 reputation points with the Church of Light. Of course, the process for that had been arduous and heavily based on luck, but still. What was even more shocking was the 1,000 reputation with the War Maniac Pavilion. The number one power in the world. This organization held 90% of the main plane's military power, and they had access to items and resources that could likely overshadow the Church of Light. Unfortunately for players, the 1,000 rep points could only be used in exchange for a common recommendation to join as an unranked warrior. Basically, what Draco had gotten from the big fuss he had made back on the first day by lasting 36 rounds in the Nightingale's Cry survival mode at rank zero. Still, joining the War Maniac Pavilion, even as a bottom feeder fighter, was far greater than joining Umbra or any other organization. This much Eva knew. Draco knew this too, and the reason he hadn't joined yet was that he knew he was nowhere near strong enough, divine class, bloodline and all. In comparison, the 70,000 gold appeared nearly insulting, but then, a free legendary treasure chest. This was beyond anything Eva had expected, for there was a 30% chance for each of these 50 fellows to come out of this with a legendary item. If they failed, they would be getting an epic item anyway, so this was a great boon. Eva could not understand why the AI would give out something so good so easily. Then, her face became bitter when she remembered that she wouldn't know anyway. No player in the previous timeline had truly survived to the end in any world event, so nobody had ever gotten any of the rewards per se. They had almost always been wiped out to the man, and nobody in their right mind who had actually survived had been suicidal enough to post the rewards they might have gotten. Eva's eyes scrolled down. So, it seemed only six guilds survived, including those two idiots Joker and Happy Scholar. Truthfully, if those two hadn't been relatively pleasant in the previous timeline, she and Draco would have been much crueler to them. Hmph. At least the rewards from this world event would certainly allow their two guilds to climb out of the rut they had gotten themselves in to regain their legendary status. One could say it was their luck. As for the individual roster, it had been completely dominated by Umbra, unlike before when the last spots had been occupied by Gentle Flower, Noble Soul, and Yui. The three guildmasters had naturally noticed this and could not help but smile bitterly, but they had made peace with their place in the world. Working with Umbra for so long had broadened their horizons so greatly that even the previous timeline version of them would be shocked and inferior. The only advantage their previous timeline selves would even have would be that they experienced more events and that they had climbed more ranks. But heh, everyone here had received 80 levels worth of XP. It seemed like many would be hitting rank 3 tonight, minus those who had to upgrade items of their own. Eva understood that the reason her play, Cement, was so high was because of her goddess form. The Angel Army and Goddess Wrath had really boosted her up but it was nothing compared to what Cobra had done. He had legitimately taken down two of the rank three Void Devourers, so the only reason Eva had managed to one-up him was because the damage of Zane and Roma had been calculated towards Eva's contribution since she had linked them to the party. But still, he felt like a munchkin compared to the almighty fitter cleric who had Lady Luck throwing him OP skills one after the another like they were grapes she was slowly feeding her hubby. With both the Starstorm that had literally cleared player and monster alike, then the Thunderstorm that had reduced all Void Devourers by 10% of their HP, how was the Vice Guildmaster of Umbra supposed to compare? Eva's eyes moved to the fellow, who was displaying a calm expression, despite probably foreseeing his soon-to-come rewards that would shake the soul of even a titled god. He then sighed and closed the screens before him, gazing into the sunset. One of his arms held his staff tightly, while the other held the voluptuous slim fatty, and his eyes seemed to glaze over. Once again, this fellow had escaped the present and was enjoying the visions of his ultimate future with grandeur and pomp. Even Eva had to admit that right now, Fitter Cleric was on top of the world. He had his luck, his money, and his beautiful babe all in hand. Who could stop him? Eva snorted and looked away. 
she swore that she would later sick Essence Stalker on him, for only that fellow could control this unbridled luckmancer. In this battle alone, he had been wild and unruly so many times that even she had gotten pissed, but she dared not fight against luck like Fitter's head on. Eva checked her personal rewards for coming in second, and they were quite good, at least three times better than those from the dragon slaying event. With this, she could arm more members of Umbra with good stuff. However, what had Eva slightly more excited were the rewards given to the guild. Eva knew what they were, but decided to inspect them anyway, just to be sure. Divine Blessing Tokens, Consumable Rank, Semi-Divine, 100% Effectiveness. Effect, summon a random true god to bless your kingdom with an iota of divine energy, strengthening it and granting it more energy permanently. Cassis Belly Wavement Scroll, Consumable Rank, Legendary, 100% Effectiveness. Effect, one can either reject a Cassis Belly despite the existence of a just cause, or one can declare war on any party without the need for a just cause. Compulsory Muster Scroll, Consumable Rank, Legendary, 100% Effectiveness. Effect, forcefully draft any group of people affiliated with your state or any neutral party within 1,000 miles of your state, regardless of their willingness. An evil expression manifested on Eva's face when she read through the effects of the latter two. They would be perfect for expanding Vita City State's conquest of regions when they eventually swallowed up the entire Paradise Lands and turned into a fledgling kingdom. The Divine Blessing token could wait until they upgraded that further to a Divine Empire. Eva had a feeling that if they rushed to use it now, they would regret it deeply later on. No, this was not some random gut feeling. This was her bloodline precognition kicking in, only that it gave her a very vague feeling and just disappeared. As such, Eva put it away and then focused on the reward for getting the last hit. It had been buried by the prompts from Suna and her foolishness, so she was super intrigued to assess what it was. System to player announcement, player riveting night, Congratulations on obtaining the last hit on the Rank 3 Void Devourer. Rewards, Semi-Divine Item. Divine Symbol, Halo Rank, Semi-Divine. Durability, 500,000, 500,000. Effects, Passive 1, Impartation. The user is able to pass any skill, technique, or ability through the Divine Symbol, thereby imbuing it with the Divine Damage ability. Passive 2, Manifestatio, N. The user is able to extract their bloodline or special genetic abilities and deify them, gaining a pseudo-divine source origin. Active 1, Transformation. The user forcefully climbs through the tiers to gain a divine rank for 10 seconds. Cooldown, 6 months. Description. The divine symbol is a horrendously rare item that attaches itself to any entity that possesses a divine bloodline but is not yet truly a divinity. It brings out the true power of the divine bloodline and eventually becomes personalized to the user after it is upgraded. Further abilities can be unlocked by sacrificing experience points. 0% of 50,000% needed to upgrade to divine rank. Chapter 468, Rewards. 2 Eva was greatly impressed by the divine symbol. It was the perfect tool for her and her specific bloodline abilities in this scenario. It would allow her to channel and abuse some special privileges of her bloodline that she knew of, but had been unable to muster as either a skill or technique. Eva took it out from her inventory and checked it out. It looked like a small white talisman that glowed with a strange glyph collagraphed in black. Eva's eyes narrowed as she was reminded that some members of her Amaterasu lineage, specifically those of the Goddess of Light inheritance, fought using talismans like this. The country called them Onmyoji locally, and the general people liked them, but internally, the Amaterasu lineage regarded them as the weakest members of that inheritance. They were the ones unable to manifest much light energy or exorcism abilities on their own, so they had no choice but to use external materials to assist themselves. Eva flicked the talisman and activated it immediately. It lit up and began burning, destroying the paper until only a glyph left floating in the air as it shone with a gold light. After seemingly charging up, it rushed into Eva's body through her chest, and she idly watched the proceedings as they happened. Eva then slightly grimaced as she felt her blood boil like someone had poured lava in her veins. She soon relaxed after the boiling subsided in about a minute, 
but she noticed that the glyph was nowhere to be found in her body. Its energy was gone, probably subsumed by her bloodline, though had Eva expected a lot more from it, given the way the system had described it. Suddenly, she felt like her back getting a bit itchy. As she reached out to scratch it, she felt something obstructing her fingers. Frowning, she cast out her void of perfection to see what was on her back, which left her speechless. Behind her was a circular halo of light that had a single black stripe running through it. It spiked out in three points, with strange Magatama symbols lying within. It looked similar to the divine halo she manifested whenever she entered her goddess form, but also not. The two had the same aura, only that the one brought out by this item looked sleeker and more refined than what Amaterasu naturally manifested. Eva touched it and tried to retract it, but failed to do so. She smiled bitterly when she realized that this would make stealth practically impossible for the foreseeable future, as she would always have her big, glowing divine symbol hovering at her back. Deciding to ignore it for now, Eva focused on its abilities in detail. The first passive didn't directly increase or decrease her damage. It simply changed the status of it and its versatility. Divine damage didn't mean much if the attack itself was weak, but it meant that there was no entity below origin rank that could negate Eva's damage. Her skill and techniques would not be able to damage true gods, although probably not semi-origin gods, as long as they went through the divine symbol. Still, this didn't mean that her attacks could penetrate all types' defenses, as normal modifiers would still be applied. It only meant that she could overcome passive skills like Warm Springs Damage Immunity or even her own Void Blessing passive that either resisted or negated damage below Divine Rank. This was an important ability because certain world bosses had such immunities as their passives. To deal with them, a large numbers of players were forced to deal enough damage to pass a certain threshold to make those world bosses enter a stun phase, allowing the players to bombard them before they entered their next combat phases. The second passive, though, was what Eva could only describe as a godsend. The ability to gain a pseudo-divine source origin was unparalleled, making her no different from a mini-titled god of sorts. Well, that was just her guess. Eva tried to manifest some divine energy, even an iota, but discovered that nothing at all came out. She frowned deeply as she tried to ga, livenize her source origin, but still nothing divine got manifested. However, the more she tried, and the more she inspected this new source origin, the more Eva understood how it worked and why she was unable to achieve it in the first place. The answer was simply because she could only store and not produce. In other words, she could receive divine energy from external sources like divine crystals or from the hands of true gods and store it within herself, using it at will. However, she could not absorb ambient worldly energy and convert it upwards or absorb what minuscule amounts of divine energy might be the atmosphere to produce her own. As such, she was extremely limited in this regard. Eva sighed. How could the AI allow her to have unbridled access to pure divine energy at a mere rank 2? It certainly wasn't sick in the head to sabotage itself so badly, so she should have known better. Even the active skill was limited in such a manner. It allowed Eva to climb up the ranks and obtain a divine rank, but not a divine source origin. It meant that Eva's damage and defense would greatly increase beyond mortal comprehension, but nothing new would manifest. Without divine energy, she could not use world-ending skills or fuel her abilities to shatter contents and whatnot. Not to mention the duration was even shorter than any of her true forms that, while below divine rank, could still technically manifest greater power. Eva sighed and let the matter go. She gathered her rewards and spoke to the core members through the raid party chat. Clean up and leave the area. Head to the rank 7 guild hall and wait for me there. Eva. After informing them of their next directive, Eva called out Luxia and mounted the Light Phoenix. With a screech, Luxia bolted through the atmosphere at unmatched speed, only leaving a streak of light in her wake. While Luxia moved through the atmosphere at light speed, Eva entered the mansion's super mini small world. She had dealt with the lesser issues of importance and now had to deal with the most important one. Eva walked through the hallways of the relatively small mansion and was greeted by the maids within. 
she reached the master bedroom and saw Zane, Hikari, and Roma seated around a small coffee table, sitting there in silence. Rila, Loki, and Rosella were not with the three, which was an obvious sign that the of them were not feeling very well. Usually picking up their children would have been the first things the mothers would do, but right now, they appeared to be managed by the Grandmaster Rank Nannies. Eva had painstakingly hired with her looted money from the Merchants Guild. Upon her entry, the three ladies gazed at Eva with a mixture of different emotions showing upon their faces. Hikari wore sadness, Zaini had a bitter smile and Roma grimaced slightly. Eva sighed and sat down next to them. The room was enveloped in a strange bout of silence for a while until Zaini spoke first. You know, sometimes I wish I was an idiot. That way I wouldn't be able to piece together things or come to sound conclusions given logical facts and occurrences. When I saw you reappear, I immediately understood everything. The what, why, and how. You quickly brought us here for reasons I understand even further. Zane's bitter smile deepened. Yet, I still feel I don't even know how to put it into words. Roma picked up. It feels like, emotionally, we have been hit with a life drain ability, then had that hammer user among the members of Umbra flatten us. Zane nodded with a light smile of amuse dominant. Yes, something like that. Hikari raised her head and looked at the three with confusion. I, I still don't entirely understand what happened. Zane opened her mouth to explain, but Eva signaled to the succubus that she would take over. I was able to use my budding telepathy and menticide to extract the reasons behind the existence of the Dark Knight and his actions. Upon mention of the Dark Knight, the three ladies flinched like they had been whipped. Eva didn't blame them, for it was his true identity that really f you could eat them up beyond compare, and was why Eva needed to give them closure. He, as you may have noticed, resembles Draco's true self perfectly. This is because he is likely a clone of Draco created through a bizarre sequence of events that I don't truly understand yet. Initially, he wanted to challenge Draco and see who was stronger, but Draco easily defeated him back then. Later, after Draco unlocked his bloodline shackles, there must have been a rebound or reflection on his clone, the Dark Knight, forcing him to manifest similar abilities, though not as pleasantly. The pain drove him mad, and he became the Metal Dragon. As I recall, only Roma had been there to face him with us at the time, as Zane's loyalty was still in question and Hikari had not yet been discovered by us. At this, Zane rub rubbed her face with embarrassment while Hikari coughed lightly. Only Roma smiled slightly, though she dared not show it overtly, otherwise her sister-wives might beat her to a pulp for her arrogance. After being defeated by Dreko in the end, he manifested once more to hunt him down. However, we did not hear from him at all in a long time. The reason for that was because he had been training himself to become stronger so he could stand a chance to beat Dreko. Unfortunately, he was hit with a rebound yet again. This was when he climbed up the ranks and hit rank 2 on his own. For some reason, he unlocked some of Draco's true memories from the alternate timeline which we returned from. Eva's eyes narrowed. What is interesting here is that he only regained memories of Draco during the first year of our misunderstanding when our conflict began. The Dark Knight himself had suspected a third party might be manipulating him using that memory, but he had been unable to really free himself. I personally agree with his assumption. There was indeed a formless hand guiding all his thoughts and actions, but I did not manage to see what it was. Whatever the case, it led him the Dark Knight to taking action, which had increased the difficulty of the event we partook in, so that his agent could get a chance to ambush me. After all, he carried the hatred of Draco during that year, so that was understandable. The problem, though, was that he was able to hide from my senses by using the same means I employed to infiltrate the Merchant's Guild. It's a double-edged sword that is useful if it's on your side, horrifying if used against us. As you know, it was Aaron, Essence Stalker, who was able to detect him in the end through the undulations of space. Not only that, but the Dark Knight was blessed had been blessed by my self-appointed mortal enemy, Suna, the retarded sun goddess. As such, the stakes were against me, and in the end, I was struck successfully by my enemy. This you all witnessed firsthand. The trio perked up here, 
for it seemed Eva was about to explain how the heck she actually survived that and managed to come back unscathed. Eva paused here and hardened her expression. This made the three ladies suck in a breath as they knew that Eva was going to reveal something extremely mind-boggling to them at this moment. Something they never could have imagined. At the moment he burned my body with all of his amassed destruction energy, I received a summons from Draco, which could not be ignored, so while it seemed like I might have been destroyed by that, the truth was that I returned to the realm of the gods. Even though Eva said this in all seriousness, the atmosphere in the room fell after she was done. The three ladies opposite her were staring at Eva with incomprehension, shock, and disbelief. They couldn't believe what she had just told them. It was incomprehensible, really. They could accept grudgingly that the Dark Knight reassembled their beloved so greatly due to some cosmic fluke or plan against Eva. But for Eva to have appeared dead to them because she coincidentally was summoned by Draco, what? First of all, to be summoned out by Draco, what did that mean? And most importantly, you mean to say we grieved and cried over your destruction, almost losing our minds with sorrow and hate while you were out on a booty call? Zane shouted out what was on all their minds with disbelief. Chapter 469 Rewards Three Eva coughed. The ominous aura emanating from the three ladies were almost palpable and she did not need to use telepathy to see that they were resisting the urge to beat her up. The vice guildmaster of Umbra had seen them in action, so she knew firsthand if they were allowed to blow their top, she might die. The power of the three of them combined was no joke, in fact, it was greater than anything else she had ever seen. Just look at what they had done to the once majestic Dark Knight. The fellow's body had been left so mangled that the system hadn't even bothered to reclaim it. If these three decided to gang up on her, they just might accomplish the very same task that the Dark Knight had failed to accomplish, and it would be her own fault. As such, she sighed dramatically and nodded. You're right. I owe the three of you an apology for my actions and negligence. We're all afflicted by the same curse of obsession, so when I saw the prompt, every other matter fled my mind. Eva admitted honestly. This made the three of them calm down greatly. Not only because they couldn't bring themselves to hate their big sis, but because they could relate with her actions. If it had been them in Eva's shoes, would they have acted differently? They could only smile wryly when they realized that they would have done the exact same thing, only that they might not even have bothered to give the others an explanation in the end. Zine sighed. We understand. Anyway, the really troublesome thing had been the existence of the Dark Knight, but now that we know the full story, I only feel pity for him, Roma agreed. I was horrified when we unmasked him because his soul aura was the exact same as Draco. It was a perfect replica. If I had been unaware that Draco was away, I would have believed that it was him. Hikari nodded. He was manipulated into hating you when he should rather be supporting you. Us. I really feel bad for him. Isn't there any way we could help him? Eva smiled strangely. You know, Draco actually said something similar. Believe it or not, he doesn't hate the Dark Knight even after he had tried to kill me. He told me that if I could, I should help him. Eva rubbed her chin in recollection. His exact words were, We clones of Lucifer have to stand by each other, because after all, we are one and the same. The three were left speechless once again. Eva wasn't surprised, because she had reacted in the same manner when he had requested that from her. In fact, someone who was unfamiliar with Draco might come to the conclusion that the bastard didn't care about Eva, but she knew better. It was just that Draco, Lucifer, and the Dark Knight were abnormally supportive of each other. While Eva doubted the last bit, Draco had suggested a means for her to verify this, which she would be doing tomorrow. It was a total contrast to herself and Amaterasu, who could not see eye to eye, as such having to compromise like a D.U.L.T.S. Eva had no clue what kind of chaos would erupt if there had also been a clone of her in this world, and luckily, she didn't have to find out. For now, Eva spent some more time chatting with the three girls and reassured them that everything was all right. She even passed on some sweet words from Draco which made all of them blush. Afterward, they exited the super mini small world with their kids to find that Luxia had long arrived at the Ether Hall. 
they parted here as Roma, Hakari, and Zayn entered the Aether Hall to settle down after a long battle, while Eva flew with Luxia over to the Rank 7 Guild Hall. Before she entered, though, Eva quickly checked up on the promised 5% tax that had been levied off Suna the retarded goddess for her actions, earning her the new nickname. System to Player Announcement A penalty has been extracted from Goddess Suna in reparations for an invalid declaration of a holy war against you. Accept, YN. Naturally, Eva accepted. Why should she let that crazy bitch get away scot-free when she had indirectly tried to erase her account? If Eva hadn't possessed an upgraded Amaterasu bloodline that made her immune to destruction energy and the like, thanks to Draco, she would have actually been destroyed. 5% seemed like a light slap, as Eva had already decided to eventually strip the goddess of everything and throw her in some dirty brothel somewhere as punishment. Nevertheless, it would suffice as a light appetizer. Congratulations on acquiring Divine Reparations Reward, Sunna's Reparations Chest. Congratulations on opening one Sunna's Reparations Chest Divine Rewards 10 Divine Crystals, 3 Divine Skill Books, 1 Divine Trial Token, 10,000 thousand Ether Coins, 1 Sun Seed, 5 Divine Guardian Contracts. Eva found herself at a loss for words. This was supposed to be just 5% of Sunna's total wealth? Could it be the retarded goddess was actually wealthy in the world of the gods then? She started her inspection with the completely new rewards in order to understand what exactly they did. Divine Trial Token, Consumable Rank Divine, 100% Effectiveness. Effect, activate this token to travel from the Divine World to the Gateway of the Origin Realm. There, you can partake in the Divine Trial and acquire many rewards. Ether Coin, Miscellaneous Rank, Legendary Description, the basic currency of the Divine World. It is denoted by a small, circular coin that is made out of a live ether crystal. Its value in the divine world is equivalent to bronze coins in the main plane. Sunseed, consumable rank, divine, 100% effectiveness. Effect, fuse with oneself to acquire the budding core of a young sun. The utility and growth of the sun depends on the user. Divine guardian contract, consumable rank, divine, 100% effectiveness. Effect, Contract any willing mortal to become your divine guardian, granting them a wisp of your divine energy in exchange for eternal servitude and indenture. Eva had to admit, Suna really had some good stuff. Not only had she unwillingly increased Eva's arsenal by three divine skill books, but all these other goodies would be far better off in the hands of their new owner. In fact, what thrilled Eva the most was the sun seed. She had longed wanted a useful fusion item like Draco's Etzkeim seedling, that would allow him to form a super mini small world in his body. The problem was that such a thing had little utility to Eva in particular. Having a small world inside one's body was great, but if Draco already had one, her having another wouldn't be of much use. On the other hand, the ability to grow a sun in her could yield so many direct benefits. She could increase her Goddess of Light Inheritance's power and all her light-based skills would, at the minimum, become ten times more powerful. The trial token reminded Eva of Draco's own Tower of Babylon token, only that this one was for the Divine World, whereas Draco's was for a unique quest in the Mortal Plane. She had no real idea what the trial was about, so she wasn't going to activate it until she entered the Divine World and gained conclusive information. The Aether Coin made Eva's lips twitch. She held one in her palm, and it really did look like a piece of an actual crystal that was cut into this shape. To find that the highly valued ether crystal was the lowest currency in the divine world was shocking to say the least. After all, Eva could tell that these coins were made from top-grade ether crystals. The product that was treated as priceless now was just akin to bronze coin up there. This, more than anything, slapped Eva in the face and told her just how great the difference between the main plane and the divine world was. Eva checked the divine crystals. They were the same shape and size as ether crystals, only that these were creamy white while the energy within then resonated with Eva more powerfully than ether crystals. Her bloodline shook and shivered in desire, wanting to swallow all the energy within these crystals, but Eva held herself back. She only had ten of them, and they could be used for a great many things. Her current plan was to have 
Draco craft her a unique set with the light dragon scales from a supreme rank dragon and then infuse it with the divine energy. That way, he should be able to easily bump it up to either pseudo-divine or even semi-divine with his talent and her cooperation. Eva inspected the guardian contracts and shook her head. Right now, they were practically useless since she had no divine energy to give in exchange for eternal servitude, although she already had some candidates in mind. However, this was for the future. Right now, Eva wanted to check the three skill books she got for free from Sunna and see if they were useful to her in any capacity. Eruption, active skill, true gods only. Rank, divine effect, cause an immense and powerful explosion that engulfs an area of your choosing. This deals 7,500% fire damage. Note 1, max fire mastery required. Note 2, must possess a sun-related divine attribute cooldown, 10 minutes. Solar Flare, Active Skill, True Gods Only. Rank, Divine Effect. Extract a thread of flame from the sun and lash an enemy or a group of enemies with it. This deals 5,000% fire damage to a single target and 1,250% to each target in an AoE cast. Note 1, Max Fire Mastery Required. Note 2, Must Possess a Sun-Related Divine Attribute Cooldown, 5 Minutes. Fire Phoenix Manifestation, Active Skill, True Gods Only. Rank, Divine Effect. Birth a new and true fire phoenix from the depths of the sun to serve you for a period of time. Note 1. Max fire mastery required. Note 2. Must possess a sun-related divine attribute duration 5 days. Cooldown 1 week. The only divine skill book Eva got so far had granted her a passive that had greatly increased her combat capability, therefore Eva immediately learned the three as quickly as possible, fearing that someone might steal them from her. She was unable to forget what Aphrodite had told her at the time. The Almighty Element Regulation skill was a basic skill amongst the true gods. It was neither unique nor special in any way. Eva was the abnormality for being able to learn skills locked to true gods as a mere mortal. Now these three skills belonging to Suna were perfect for her. With the Sun Seed, these divine skills would show even greater power, but what shook Eva was not the high damage ratings or the crazy effects, it was the cooldowns. However, she had no reason to be shocked. Her Celestial Prime class worked differently. It allowed her to learn Divine Skill as if she was a divinity herself. Therefore, when she wielded these skills, the system treated her as if she was a true goddess. How could a true god take an entire year to recast their skills? Or even days? Did that make sense? It was completely different from when Rena and Co. used the active skills of their divine items. Those were produced and fueled by the item itself, not Rena or whomever happened to be wielding them. As such, it made sense that the item would take a year or more to reset, as it needed to charge up the energy spent. This was why it was important to have a divine source origin, because with divine energy, the cooldown could be instantly reset and recast assuming other conditions were met. Eva enjoyed normal cooldowns because it was assumed that she was using divine energy, but she was actually using mana. How the game or the AI parsed the logic and the mechanics behind this was beyond her, but she was glad to know it worked like this. If this was the case, then Eva would have to search high and low for divine skills. She would also need to find a few abyssal skills, as she had tested her void form and its abilities were likely crazier than even her goddess form. Eva settled down and got down from Luxia's back. They had long arrived in front of the rank 7 guild hall, only that Eva had spent all this time contemplating and calculating. Now it was time to address the members of Umbra. Chapter 470 Umbra's Plans for the Future As usual, there was quite a crowd before the skyscraper that was the rank 7 guild hall. In fact, some enterprising fellows had long since established businesses nearby to capitalize on the fame of Umbra's building to rake in profits. Most of these businesses were restaurants and lounges, with a few hotels thrown in, catering to the players who refused to give up on Umbra's recruitment test and tried every day. Of course, passing via such a method would be almost impossible due to how strenuous Eva had set it up to be. Ironically, there were even some bastardly fellows who had started using the test as a training regime, honing their skills with every attempt in order to reach a certain standard of skill. Some guilds had even started scouting those fellows to add them to their ranks. 
Not that Eva ever cared about what those unaffiliated with Umbra did in their own time. She just ignored the crowd, slowly and stately entering the guild hall to see their unbothered secretary, who, as usual, was playing solitaire on her PC. Upon seeing the first vice guildmaster, she quickly closed her tab and rose to her feet, greeting Eva with respect. Eva simply returned the greeting and didn't bother to reprimand her in any way. Not like she had any actual work to do, she was just down here to greet guests. Eva took the elevator to the floor for the guild assembly room. There was a chattering crowd within that were loosely organized, talking about the event they had just partaken in and the ill estrious rewards. They spoke about the great performances of the various core members while theorizing about the sudden attack and disappearance of the lady boss. Once the players of Umbra saw Eva enter the room, though, they immediately quieted down and arranged themselves properly. As everyone aside, the core members had perished at the hands of Rank Three Void Devourers, they had been hit with serious debuffs. Those who had been killed had revived with a loss of seven levels, minus 45% XP gain for 48 hours, and a minus 65% to their stats for 24 hours. However, the members of Umbra were not bothered by this. Waiting out the 48-hour XP limitation and the stat debuff was merely at the level of a mild annoyance. As for the seven levels lost, that was quite a problem, but nothing they couldn't resolve in time. This was the difference between the majority of the top players in the last timeline and this one. Back then, world events had sprung up without prior warning. Participation had been mandatory, forcibly making them stronger while bearing great losses due to their own weaknesses. In this timeline, the AI was acting considerably softer since it had delegated this brutality to the two reincarnators, Draco and Eva. In truth, the previous timeline's AI had the right goal, but its means had been very inefficient. This was seen by the fact that the player's foundations were so poor that they got stuck semi-permanently at rank 6, not even able to reach divinity, much less cross into other sections of the game after so long. Draco and Eva had completely fixed this problem overall, and had fortified the foundations of all players with each event that came, enlightening them more than their past selves through a bevy of means. This all bled into why Umbra's members were seemingly nonchalant. They were not as inexperienced or as pressured by their own lack of ability to grow compared to themselves in the past timeline. Many even had time to pursue other fancies, like building clans in Vita City State and the like, while some hardly came back home as they were fervently exploring the entire continent. Eva climbed up the podium and nodded to the core members who stood at the forefront of the crowd, then to the five generals and sublime who stood behind her on the podium. The Abyss World event has come to an end, and Umbra, as expected, reigns supreme in the individual and guild rankings. We have swallowed a bevy of rewards, but it could have been much better had we all survived to the end. Eva began her speech. The is is mostly my fault, as I had a plan to keep most of you alive, but was caught unprepared by the ambush of an old foe. As such, in the downtime I had spent getting everything back together, many of you had perished at the hands of the Rank Three Void Devourers. As promised, everyone who has participated gets a base reward of 100 Umbra points. The members of Umbra cheered happily. Even back when an Umbra point had been only equivalent to one gold coin, they had felt that it was a great reward, much less now that it was worth an entire platinum coin. That was a free 100 platinum, just for showing up. It was more than enough to rectify all the losses they had taken because of the event, whether it was durability of equipment, loss of XP, or loss of items. Eva didn't stop there. There will be an internal grading in a few days' time. The minimum threshold is 10 million damage dealt over the course of the event. Every point above that nets an extra 0.00001 Umbra points. That is for the points ranking. For the position ranking, the top 100 will get additional rewards. 100th to 50th place will be granted a free compatible epic item of their choice. 49th to 11th place will receive a handcrafted legendary item from the Guildmaster after he returns. As for the top 10, you will follow me on a special journey to a certain place. There, we will acquire your rewards, likely through use of force. As you can imagine, 
the value of those rewards will be out of this world, but whether you will receive them, which is compatible with you, I cannot promise. Eva paused here to let the excitement sink in to the listening members. They took this cue to chatter among themselves with visibly joy. The rewards for this event had not been small at all. Any other guild that tried this would likely go broke before they even finished the first few lines. When Eva opened her mouth to speak again, the crowd died down as they listened attentively to what she had to add to what came before. I have spoken to the guildmaster, and there are many things he shared with me that should greatly change the situation of our guild when he returns. As such, we have to make ample preparations to receive him and his boons properly. First things first, all members are to stop extraneous quests and focus on clearing out all field zones of the Paradise Lands within one month. The entire area zone should be ready for us to swallow under Vita City State by then. Secondly, the guild had received some special items during the Dragon Slaying event, items that allow us to upgrade buildings and a kingdom expeditiously. It is now time to utilize these boons. We will have to prepare the base buildings before Draco returns so that the upgrade can be simultaneously held at that time. Thirdly, the city-state is in need of more true citizens. That means that all of you who have already gained the genetic compatibility are expected to sire more spawns. This is not compulsory, but for every child you have, you will receive some benefits from the state. Fourthly, during the negotiations with the various top powers, Draco managed to fleece acquire some good conditions in exchange for land. They are as follows. Three people are allowed to take the test of holiness from the Church of Light. Three candidates are eligible to take the Money is Power quest from the Merchant Guild. Three people will be sent over to study the Tablet of Magic for two months inside the Mages Association. From the Cario Continental Council, we have not only gained a seat of representation, but also three votes. As for the Trade Skill Association, they agreed to tutor three apprentices under a Grandmaster. Finally, there is the War Maniac Pavilion, offering us two slots into the Battle Realm. Before I explain how these slots will be distributed, let me explain the value of these various slots. The Test of Holiness allows a player of the Cleric class to undertake a trial that grants them the chance to become Divine Messenger. This class is able to form a bridge between the main P, Lane, and the Divine World, and is important to both the Church of Light and Umbra as a guild. The Money is Power quest from the Merchant Guild doesn't grant a new class, but rather a rare passive skill called Money Talks. With this, players will be able to use the barest minimum of funds to bribe their way through anything and everything. The Tablet of Magic is a superior and special item that has one important function for all spellcasters. It allows you to develop the technique to cast magic without using spellbooks. It also helps you develop the ability to double cast and triple cast, so this two-month period is exceedingly crucial. Author's note, as explained in a previous chapter, this is not the same as subjective magic. Theirs is greatly inflexible and uses mana, while Draco's is exceedingly versatile, has endless growth potential, and uses any form of fuel he can cook up. A seat of representation on the Cario Continental Council allows us to manipulate the laws of the continent to our favor, like the true elites of society. With three votes, we can safely say that we will have 12% of the total deciding power of the entire council, which is a lot for one mere city-state. As for becoming an apprentice to a Grandmaster, I don't think I need to explain the value of this to any trade skill player here. The Battle Realm is like a small world filled with endless war and bloodshed. You enter, you fight until you cannot, and then you are graded based on your performance. Rewards are given accordingly afterward. Eva's eyes roved the crowd of silent Umbra members who despite hearing earth-shaking stuff did not react at all. This was the obedience drilled into them brutally by Riveting Knight, and the current Eva Tarasu was greatly thankful for that. As for the distribution, there will be smaller competitions held by the parties who are suitable for these slots. Don't worry, all core members will be excluded, as that would be quite pointless given the gap between you and them at the current stage. I will be personally hosting these events. As for the core members who survived the Abyss World event, 
Your current task will be to reach rank 3 at all costs before Draco returns. The final matter for consideration is that the guild must be raised to a tier 4 hegemon. We have been stuck at a tier 3 organization for too long. This is something I will also handle myself, so focus on the tasks that will be given to you in the next few hours. Eva ended her talk and left the state to Sublime and Co., who would coordinate the rest. As for Eva herself, she left the Rank 7 Guild Hall in order to prepare for her short journey with the Top 10 of the Abyss World event. They would be heading to a location that Eva and Draco had planned to ransack a while back, but never got around to due to how busy they both had been. Not only that, they had been too weak to even dream of trying such a thing. Now, with her two divine items, Yasakani no Matagama and Yada no Kagami, as well as her three forms, she could lead an elite team to do the dirty deed. Right now, Eva wanted to first head to the Anomaly Realm and activate the Sun Seed. Once she planted it within herself, her raw power would greatly increase to incredible proportions. With all these factors lined up, how could her targets walk away unscathed? Hey, hey back then, they had stepped over her and Draco, because they had been weak little rank ones, nothing worth even stressing about. Now the tables had turned, and it was her turn to stomp all over them, giving Eva Tarasu a sick thrill, mostly coming from riveting night. Those rank seven powers who had funded and supported Joker and Happy Scholar on their foolish quest to resist Umbra, thereby starting the hectic void infestation emergency quest, did they really think that since everyone had been quiet about it for so long, there would be no repercussions? Chapter 471, The Competition Won Draco relaxed in the bathtub, lazily twirling his legs as he pondered over the earlier announcement. The voice of the refinement god had pervaded every single corner of the treasury, so he was certain that everyone had heard it. He was wondering if others would actually come to compete? At first glance, the answer should obviously be yes, but Draco would disagree. After all, he had spent a great amount of time back then, going from village to village, enlightening the denizens within regardless of their status. To enlighten others, he needed to possess something they did not, and he had perfectly displayed that in every single village. Not to mention that his actions showed extreme benevolence and understanding. They should feel indebted, no? However, Draco also understood that no matter what, expecting all of them to miss out on such a rare event would be a bit much. Not to mention that there would be some fellows who didn't give a damn about such things. Draco had learned that around 200 competitors attended the competition on average from the past few times it was held. It was unclear how many would attend this time given his actions. Still unhurried, the fellow decided against having another meal, as he just did. In fact, this bath was just for him to spend some time with his thoughts while in a place of comfort. He currently had three trade skills at the Grandmaster rank, blacksmithing, alchemy, and enchanting. Two trade skills at the expert rank, magical engineering and scrivener, as well as three trade skills at the amateur rank, privateering, dungeon creation, and skill fusion. This lineup was quite potent, minus the amateur trade skills, as they should hardly make a difference in the evaluation. However, Draco was confident that he would win hands down either way. Vishad, the Lizardman Mayor of Evergreen Village, specifically said, After all, the inheritance of the Refinement God is not for superficial things like rank or skill. The only requirement to pass the competition's various tests is talent. Talent, not skill, not rank, not creativity. Talent, Draco surmised that the competition therefore would be short. Most tournaments of such types were all about testing skill, so there would be complex stages where every aspect of a contender's skill would assessed in relation to the competition being held. But a test of talent was simple. Draco figured he would be in and out within hours, which was why he was feeling comfortable lazing about. What constituted talent in this regard? Was it having more trade skills than others at a higher rank? Was it the speed at which one climbed the ranks of their trade skill? Or was it the comparison between attained trade skill ranks compared to the player's rank? There were more than a few ways to gauge someone's talent, but Draco's endless confidence came from the fact that no matter what method would be used, he was sure he would come out on top. Boss, 
Let's be real. This fellow spawned into existence less than one year ago, and he had already brought three trade skills to the Grandmaster rank. Although they were just basic trade skills, it was hard enough to reach Grandmaster rank in just one area. It wasn't for fun that two trade skill origin gods sought to bless him. They also had recognized him. If even origin gods were impressed with this fellow, what dog thing would the semi-origin refinement god have to be to pretend like he wasn't? Draco sighed and exited his bath, leisurely wiping himself. He met Hoover on his way out, who bowed and informed him. My lord Draco, let me take you to the usual grounds for the competition and settle you in. Draco smiled at the reliable butler and manifested his armor. The duo then exited the evergreen manor and walked along his picturesque pathways in silence. Draco was still imagining how the competition would be held while Hoover was raking his brains how to remain as Draco's butler regardless of the outcome. The moment Draco left the manor, though, the two fellows, Cheong Chi and Clarence, suddenly opened one eye each. The whole time, they had been asleep with their families in a special wing of the manor cordoned for them. But now they had awoken. What was even scarier was that the two fellows did not stand up or say anything. They just made eye contact, smiled, and closed their eyes once again, easily falling back to sleep. These two bastards, just what crazy stunt were they planning to do this time? Draco and Hoover soon reached the town hall. Vishad stood outside with his arms clasped behind his back, talking to three youths with a stern expression. With his passive control, Draco could easily hear what he was saying. He was chastising them for participating when Draco was as well, but the kids insisted that this would be the only chance in their life. Against this, Vishad could not argue. The competition was held every millennia, and these kids would not live until the next one. Even if they might feel bad to compete against Draco, they wanted to experience the competition for themselves so that they could broaden their horizons and live their life without regrets. Besides, if Lord Draco is so good, then us going should not make a difference, as his superiority would render us weaker regardless, right? Vishad's face became black from this painful logic, but he could not retort because they just stated the truth. Draco, who overheard this, silently agreed with them. He shouldn't be bothered by how many come, but rather his ability to surpass them all rightfully. Which was more impressive? Being first among a hundred? Or being first among ten thousand who were equally skilled to the hundred? Limiting his competition would net him an easy win, but not a meaningful one. Since he was a trade-skilled genius and he knew it, Draco felt his earlier thoughts were too conceited. Vishad saw Draco and ended the conversation. Instead, he ushered the fellow close and began explaining some rules and details about the competition. In the meantime, the three young competitors observed him quietly to see how he'd changed ever since he had voluntarily enlightened everyone. There was likely not a single person in the entire inner section of the treasury that did not know his face. They found that his aura was more intense as he had ranked up since then. Not to mention the fact that he exuded an infallible confidence that suppressed them greatly. Combined with Vishad's earlier talk, they kept having thoughts like, Maybe I shouldn't have come. Why did I think I could challenge him? And he's too strong. There's no hope. Hoover's eyes flashed when he noticed the growing depression in the other fellows, and Vishad also noticed their darkening countenances. They both knew that this was not mere aura, but direct psychological warfare Draco was using. However, both men kept mum. It was clear which side they had placed their bet on, so they weren't going to shoot themselves in their own foot by talking. Not to mention that this was neither banned nor illegal. Draco would just have to be clever about it. If he reached the competition area and spread it out wantonly, the other mayors would break their wards free, and such a method would not easily work twice. As such, he had to suppress it until only the competitors went on stage, then he could oppress his competition cruelly. The two shared a look and nodded, thinking that this was a sound plan. Draco himself was impressed. Eva was right. Mind control was a truly powerful psychic ability they had. Even though his was far weaker, he could use it more freely because there was less of a chance for him go out of control like creating hive minds or the like. Similarly, 
This was why Eva preferred using telekinesis directly before unlocking more of her psychic abilities, since it was harder to control but had a lower chance of mishap for her. Draco absorbed the rules and advice given by Vishad quietly until they left Evergreen Village through a portal in the underbelly of the town hall. Apparently, it was the same one they used to send goods to the core area. Draco was G, really interested in seeing what was on the other side. When they manifested, he was left utterly speechless. The core area that was blockaded by a dome of origin energy was actually a small palace that had been constructed in an archaic and indescribable style. Draco had never seen constructions like this in any history book, which was fair since the refinement god was a semi-origin god from the old era. As a trade skill god, it was likely that their creativity was out of this world. Draco immediately noticed that aside from the palace, there was a small field right before the building that was occupied by many youngsters, like the ones next to Draco. It seemed like Evergreen was actually one of the last to arrive. This was due to Draco, as he had felt no pressure from the competition, unlike these natives who were reverent of their supreme ancestor and made sure to appear as soon as they possibly could. Once again, many eyes fell on him. They all had witnessed his great prowess in trade skills, so they were taking stock of their most worrisome competitor. There was no more reverence and wonder in their eyes from a few months before, but fire and the will to battle. The mayors who had pined for Draco to visit their villages and enlighten their people now greeted him neutrally and in a lukewarm manner, with slight smiles on their faces. Vishad harumphed coldly. These ungrateful old gits had most likely hyped up their village members to participate in the competition, helping them get rid of whatever apprehension of indebtedness they had to Draco, replacing it with a competitive spirit. Draco, though, was unbothered. When he eventually won the competition, he would take the entire treasury and its people away. He would not need so many mayors to take care of the entire tribe. They would be merged into one in Vita City State, only needing one mayor at the time. This was why Vishad had wholly cast his bet on Draco, while the other mayors hyped up their own youth. It was simple politics, if anything. Evergreen's four candidates joined the rest, who amounted to almost 400 this time. Clearly, the other mayors had felt desperate due to Draco's talent compared to other outsiders from the past, so they had scrounged and squeezed out every talent they had and had forced them to come. If they couldn't win, at least they should work together to suppress Draco in some manner or sabotage him in any way possible. 400 contenders was a record number in the history of the competitions, and this was all because of this bastard. Draco was surprised to see that it was the opposite of what he had surmised earlier, but then again, he had given the mayors too much credit. They had fully displayed their shamelessness this time, but he would hold no grudge for it. Hoover and Vishad, though, were cursing and insulting them in their hearts, not understanding how anyone could be so despicable. Soon, everything was cut off by a resounding voice that was the same as the one that announced the competition earlier, likely that of the refinement god. Now that every village has arrived with its millennial talents, the competition shall proceed shortly. I have noticed, though, that this particular session has almost twice the usual candidates. That is good, for the more who compete, the higher the chances of my requirements being met. The mayors smiled and bowed, like they had done all this to please the spirit of the Supreme Ancestor when Draco and Co. knew the truth. First, I shall evaluate the souls of all hopeful candidates to search for any form of malpractice or insidious existence who hope to steal my inheritance. The voice added coldly. Draco rubbed his chin. This was what he had already speculated, but this just confirmed that some true gods must really have wanted to pilfer the refinement god's heritage. A clever way to do so would be to use either the outsiders to enter as their proxy or plant a lineage in the treasury from past competitions to attempt to steal the inheritance at some point. It was not too far-fetched, though. If Draco lost the competition, he would have to leave Ophi and Co. behind, who were likely all pregnant. If they birthed his spawn, his bloodline would continue on in the treasury and mix with theirs. If Draco left some sleeper codes in his bloodline to activate later on, 
he could have a descendant steal away the inheritance legally and then enjoy the benefits without the refinement god being able to do anything about it. Chapter 472 The Competition 2 Draco and the other candidates seemed unbothered, as if they had expected this much. Clearly, the mayors of the various villages had informed their candidates of the various procedures of the competition before it had officially begun, but nothing of the activity itself. Apparently, what occurred next was not exactly visible to the onlookers. Draco stood ramrod still as it got to his turn and his body and soul were searched by this spirit of the refinement god. Of course, upon inspecting him, it reeled back in utter shock, for the exact same reasons the origin gods had blessed him. Such a powerful yet chaotic bloodline and his special existence allowing him to come back to life endlessly unless his spirit got destroyed. What the fuke was happening out there nowadays? Shouldn't the state of the main plane be worse than the old era? The spirit decided to stay silent about its worries as it continued. It had sensed no malevolence or skullduggery in Draco. In fact, it was even able to realize that this outsider was guided here through his own achievements from an early stage. Author's note, i.e., the NPC refinement god sensed that Draco was brought here through a quest that was rewarded to him, not by luck or by intention. After going through the minds and souls of all the candidates, the spirit relaxed and spoke again. As none of you are found wanting, the competition shall begin without further delay. Close your eyes and envision an item you yourself have created. Its rank is irrelevant, and so is its quality. The candidates closed their eyes and began picturing whatever items they had brought into this world through crafting or designing. As for Draco, his eyes flashed as he quickly understood what was happening here. Vishad, and likely the other mayors to their candidates, had told him of this test, but not the meaning behind it. They knew the tests that would occur since the refinement god held everything right here, and no rule had ever prevented the supervising mayors to record what they had witnessed to their future successors, even though they had no idea how it was graded or what each test was supposed to evaluate. The only thing they knew was what the refinement god directly told them, that this competition only sought talent, not skill or experience. Draco had been the guildmaster of a divine tier guild in the previous timeline. When Hellscape had been recruiting players, he had been the one to design the tests for the combat players and the trade skill players himself, unlike this timeline where he had left this task to Eva. Then again, when he was leading Hellscape, he and Eva had been mortal enemies. So there was that. Anyway, Draco understood what this test was evaluating. Ego. A lot of theories and suggestions had come to the minds of the preceding mayors which they had noted down. Could this be testing creativity, honesty, attention to detail, or focus? To Umbra's guildmaster, it was as clear as day. This was a test of ego to gauge the arrogance of the competitors. The wording was very specific towards the end. Its rank is irrelevant and so is its quality. That last statement was what clarified exactly what this was all about. Envision an item, regardless of its rank or quality. Would you put forth a common, uncommon, or even a trash-tier item? Or would you put forth your pride and joy, the one item you've made that had surpassed all that came before, and perhaps even those that came after? Most people would read that last phrase as the refinement god reassuring them, but that was not the case. This was a competition, where the best talent would emerge victorious. Even if the spirit phrased it like that, no one present was going to envision a common rank item they made. Creators and crafters were one of the most egotistic people in the world. Whether writer, artist, artisan, mason, cook, brewer, etc., every single one of these people subconsciously believed that whatever they created was a masterpiece that deserved world acclaim and reverence. They believed only they could truly judge the value of their creation, and many did not like dissenting opinions to that matter. It was simply a part of the trade. Editor's note, now we have it black on white that our dear author has a god complex. However, the creators who had received world-acclaimed titles for their art, sculpts, or musical pieces usually had one underlying factor. They had cast away that innate belief that their work was a masterpiece and had viewed it for what it was, innately flawed and imperfect. Then, they had worked on their project over and over, 
removing any issues within before releasing it to the public. Naturally, such works would instantly become the favorites of many in the world. Alas, this only applied to the crafter in question's first popular work. Usually after that, their ego would come back in full force, and their quality would begin to decline because they would be unable to return to that ego-free mentality. The refinement god could be said to be the primogenitor of all trade skills, or at least that was what they were trying to achieve before they fell, most likely. To inherit such a legacy, how could the successor be allowed to have their head up their ass? Draco pondered over this and noticed that the spirit was looking at him quietly. While it may currently be almost intangible and ethereal, he could still feel it looking at him and prodding through his thoughts via his dark angel inheritance. It would be easy to lock it out, as his psychic abilities were not a joke, but that would probably just disqualify him. Besides, there was no harm in the refinement god taking an interest in him over the rest. Most importantly, the spirit's reaction revealed that Draco's deduction had been right, hence its intrigue. However, the downside to this was that since he was aware of the true meaning of the test, and the spirit was aware of that now, he could no longer cheap his way out by intentionally envisioning something simple to look humble. Draco felt the spirit reel in shock from his rapid thoughts and deductions. It tried to close its own mind off from him, but it was impossible. If it wanted to continue reading Draco's mind, he too would be able to glean into the spirit's emotions and some surface thoughts. It was like constructing a bridge over a river. Yeah, you who built the bridge on the west side of the river would be able to cross over it, but the same was true for the fellow on the east side who had been watching you build it. The only way to prevent that would be to break the bridge, which the spirit of the refinement god could not do since it needed to parse through Draco's mind for this test. Quite the conundrum. A test of ego where he couldn't deliberately act humble and trying to be smart using reverse psychology to act arrogant would also backfire. How was he supposed to pass that then? Draco merely shrugged as he finished that thought. He decided to imagine whatever he wanted. Whether or not he passed was up to the criteria of the refinement god in the first place, so why should he stress himself needlessly over it? No matter how he tried to outsmart the spirit, with their minds connected like this, it would be an endless rabbit hole. As such, Draco envisioned the advanced spatial creation device he had made. When the refinement god latched onto it, it was shocked beyond measure. This was an item that was inconceivable in creation for this era, but had also been impossible in the old one. If this wasn't a test of ego, but one of skill or ingenuity, Draco would have scored 100%. Even the refinement god's spirit found itself lost in the marvel of such a unique and abstract creation that defied the very laws of nature. However, its entrancement was interrupted by Draco's snicker. A mental version of himself manifested beside the floating advanced spatial creation device and waved at the device. Immediately, the construct dissembled and an ether crystal flew out of it and entered his hand. Ha! <sighs> you think it was hard to make this? Take a look. He threw the ether crystal over to the manifestation of the refinement god spirit in his mind, which grabbed the item and inspected it. Once it did, its face full or marvel froze as it trembled with emotions. Draco identified quickly as indignation and disbelief. Draco turned and showed the refinement god his back as he spoke deeply. It took me only 30 seconds to envision this after learning a basic design from another crafter. Sigh, if only half of my talent could be shared among these lads, wouldn't they become origin gods by tomorrow? The refinement god's spirit that was an intangible whitish color instantly became black from anger. In this first test, there should only be two grades. It was either humble or egotistic. Humble netted a tentative pass while egotistic counted as an automatic fail. As for Draco, the spirit could not allot him into either category because he didn't fully satisfy the criteria of either given his actions and words. Instead, he acquired his own unique grading that the refinement god spirit could not find itself able to change. Draco's grade in the first test was neither humble nor egotistic, but utterly shameless. The spirit, unable to bear him anymore, fled his mind and checked on the other contestants. It graded them one by one. 
Due to the increased number of contestants, there were far more passes with the humble grade than before. Usually, only about 10 to 15 would get this grade, but this time a whopping 50 would pass to the next round. This was most likely because the mayors had forced some fellows to attend, and such people were not the type who liked to stand out. They just loved to craft for crafting's sakes. So they had envisioned their first items and reminisced about how great it felt to make their first work. Such meaningful constructs won the spirit's favor in this test, unbeknownst to anyone. The refinement god's spirit suddenly shuddered as if a cold breeze had passed over its enakakied back and turned to see the face of Draco turn towards its general location with a smile plastered on his face. Cough, well make it that one person was aware of the purpose of this test, the spirit then spoke to the crowd again. Now, focus on the palace you see in the distance. Mentally describe how it appears to have been constructed to you. Feel free to highlight anything special you find about it. Draco's lips twitched. Once again, he quickly grasped the purpose of this test. Just as before, the hint was placed in the final sentence, for all those astute enough to glean. It wasn't that Draco's IQ was higher than anyone else. It was just that the denizens here had been limited by their seclusion in this small world for hundreds of thousands of years. None had the experience in gathering and testing people en masse like Draco, who had done so in a variety of ways to sift through chaff. In fact, most players who had been to college or written exams extensively would be able to glean the hidden meanings rather quickly. Exams were annoying, but they made the modern ADU Welt more intuitive about the true constraints of tests compared to these medieval fellows who had never been forced to write intensive tests and had instead rather honed their combat skills. In this test, describing the palace was meaningless, no matter how accurate you were. As the spirit said in the last sentence, they were free to point out anything particularly special about it. In other words, this was actually a test of observation. A creator or a crafter needed to be far more observant than any other type of person. One needed to look at something within their field or work, and no matter how abstruse it was, they needed to be able to glean the core of the matter. For example, an architect who was given blueprints drawn up by his predecessor, who had been fired, had quit on his own, or had perhaps died. This replacement would need to assess the blueprint drawn by his predecessor and identify all its strengths and weaknesses quickly in order to develop upon it successfully. Another example would be, he writer of a script. If he was given the task to make a sequel to a very popular prequel, he would have to scrutinize the style of the tales that came before and figure out how to develop upon them so that the sequel would be lauded as an even better tale not something that conflicted or detracted from the original. Chapter 4 for 73, Pinnacle Intelligence Draco was beginning to notice a pattern to these tests. The first one had tested ego, and this one tested observation. It might seem random, but it should actually be directly tied to the refinement god situation and likely to their inheritance. When Draco thought back to him, entering this unique quest, the first thing he had encountered had been a test of his combat strength. The refinement god had, for some reason, only burdened the outsider with it, although it was an optional one. What was the purpose of this? Draco had ascertained that it was very likely that the refinement god had been unable to fight, much less kill a rat, having dedicated all their life to trade skills. During the War of the Gods, the refinement god must have been the target of a particular deific faction, the same one Eva suspected had funded, supplied Sigurd with the means to slaughter all the dragons. The timing had been just too good back then, since things had been completely chaotic. It would have been extremely easy for a hidden faction to put many things in place that would greatly topple the world and allow them to establish themselves in the aftermath. The duo had only reached these separate but joint conclusions recently, mostly after the god's envoy, Kilabar, had told them about the pantheons and the general political structure of the divine world. Those few lines had revealed so much information, especially information that bound two pieces of abstract data that had originally been hard to connect. 
There was also the time Draco had used his upgraded eyes of Kalo to peer into the past where he had seen Sigurd training in the ancestral city of dragons. These little tidbits had allowed him to figure out the skeletal structure of the story. However, they would need a bit more before they could unveil the rest. However, in reference to the refinement god, they must have been killed and almost plundered of all their wealth and inheritance. Luckily, the refinement god had prepared this treasury ahead of time. But wait! This was where Draco encountered the first flaw in his theory. How would the refinement god have known ahead of that time to prepare this treasury? The faction that had orchestrated their death was likely tied to the one that had eradicated the dragons. If even the dragons had been unable to see their demise coming, how could it be different for one measly semi-origin god who had more than likely holed themselves up their entire lives, not caring about anything apart from honing their skill? This was answered when Draco had been whisked to the realm of the Origins gods the first time, and he was addressed by the origin god of alchemy, Copernico. At that time, Copernico's words had been, Currently, partaking in little Norma's test, huh? I guess someone must sooner or later acquire that heritage. Not only that, but possessing such talent, for combat and trade skills combined, such bloodlines, what a monster. Remember, boy, I do this because of your bright future, your talent, and for you to succeed in inheriting little Norma's path. Do not fail me. Putting aside the refinement god being called Norma, Copernico had known that they had designed a legacy test and that Draco was partaking in it. He also said that someone must sooner or later acquire it, as well as stating that the only reason he helped Draco was to help him acquire the refinement god's heritage. This told him three things. Firstly, the origin gods was aware that the refinement god had set up an inheritance test. One should know, the outside world only thought that this location held all the rewards, but had no idea about there being tests. This Draco knew thanks to Vishad. Secondly, whatever trade skill the refinement god was trying to carry to the origin rank was important to the origin gods. It could be that having another origin god would strengthen their forces and relieve their collective burden, but Copernico had never focused on that specifically. Thirdly and most importantly, the origin god fully supported the refinement god and wished for someone to take up their mantle and continue. As such, two whole origin gods had wasted their time giving him a bit of origin energy solely as an incentive. From these three facts, and the fact that the refinement god had been affectionately called Little Norma, Draco had deduced that the ones who warned them about the incoming danger were the origin gods themselves. Damn! If this was true, then the matter of the old era was a much bigger cluster fuke than Draco had thought. For even origin gods to have been unable to just directly punch downwards and smash all troublemakers to death, forcing them to use roundabout means to warn the people they cared about. So the refinement god must have placed a combat test at the start of this unique quest to make sure that their prospective inheritor would have sufficient combat talent such that they would not be so helpless when confronted with other combat-capable enemies. But this, as stated before, had merely been optional. It hadn't been a life-and-death requirement. After all, the most important bit was still to make sure that the prospective inheritor would actually be compatible with the inheritance itself. And there had been a waiting period for an apparently random amount of months for the outsider to come into this small world, allowing them to learn the trade skill methods from the old era. This would allow them to merge whatever they had learned outside with some tidbits of the legacy the refinement god had left behind for their descendants. Looking back and taking everything into consideration, this must have been another type of test. After all, this entire small world was managed by the refinement god's spirit. It was likely that nothing got past its eyes, so it would definitely have seen Draco's obscene growth in such a short period of time, as well as his act of enlightening the people of the treasury. Or rather, could it be that the reason the competition had been held so late into the timeline was because the refinement god had wanted to give him bonus time for his act of kindness? If that was so, it would make a lot of sense, actually. One good deed deserved another, 
by helping its descendants without conditions, it too allowed him to hone his trade skills extra sharply. As stated before, Draco had managed to reach Grandmaster rank in blacksmithing and alchemy, and he had raised magical engineering as well as scrivener to expert rank in just around six to eight months. This was unheard of anywhere in the world, and he only had been able to achieve it thanks to the resources in this treasury. That much Draco knew in his heart. His original projections had seen him reaching Grandmaster rank in blacksmithing or alchemy after two to three years at best. This was because, on the outside, he would never have had the freedom to dedicate his time to trade skills. There were far too many things for him to do and to accomplish, such that he could only practice trade skills when he was actually using them for a purpose, not solely for the sake of leveling them up. Draco raised his head to gaze at the refinement god's spirit that was staring at the candidates as they tried to mentally describe the palace to it. For Draco, it was as if time had slowed down as he had thought about everything up until this point. Well, it wasn't exaggerated nothings. His pinnacle intelligence one passive skill had kicked in, along with his dark angel inheritance. The two had combined to boost his mental faculties with so much processing power that it had allowed him to extrapolate and rationalize so quickly that time had slowed down to the point that merely seconds had passed since the spirits explaining their test. Draco circled round his conclusions and questions, coming back to what brought it all up, the style and structure of the official competition's tests. Why ego? Why not honesty, creativity, or focus? All of them could easily have been judged in that same test with a twist of words, and to be honest, they appeared much more important to a Kra, father than ego. Asking a creator to not even have a bit of ego was truly hard, especially someone who was successful with what they had made. It was natural to feel pride in your work. If not, then why did I waste my precious time making it, so that I could slap it on my fridge door and forget it existed? Draco understood that the underlying reason was simply due to his assumption earlier. The refinement god needed an inheritor that was free of ego, that could look at something unfinished and see it as imperfect. Only then would they be able to fix it to the best of their ability, bringing out the best possible form of it. So, going by Copernico's revelations and some extrapolated data, here's the conclusion Draco reached. Whatever inheritance the refinement god wanted to give out, most likely the trade skill path they had developed and that the origin gods were looking forward to was incomplete. Damn. Once Draco thought this, his mind whirred even faster as he connected many more dots. The refinement god had not reached origin rank yet, surely because they were still carving out their own path, and likely had reached the point of conclusion. The secret faction in the dark must not have wanted to see that happen, so they had killed the refinement god before they could ascend. The origin gods didn't want this, but couldn't prevent the refinement god's death, so they had opted to create an elaborate test in their stead to find a person who could. What did the competition test? Was it skill? Rank? No, as the refinement god's spirit had said itself, it wanted talent. It didn't matter whether the fellow was amateur rank or god rank, whatever inheritance the refinement god had thought up required absurd trade skill talent, talent on the level of Norma the refinement god themselves to complete. Otherwise, it would forever remain unfinished in the hands of a chosen successor if they didn't have talent up to that par. The second test, observation. Why was observation necessary? Sure, it would be good if a trade skill crafter had that, but things like insight, deduction, and knowledgeability could have been tested here with a twist of words, and like the first test, they seemed much better choices. It was in the understanding Draco had reached that prompted him to see the pattern. Observation for a trade skill crafter was only needed in high quality if the crafter in question was picking up a semi-completed work and needed to develop upon it, like a writer working on a sequel or an architect finishing a started blueprint. If they didn't have the mental faculty and skill to see every single detail of the source material, whatever they added to finish it would be rubbish. It would either detract from the source material or even ruin it altogether. Even the slightest deviation could lead the path astray by miles. 
Whoever was going to take up the inheritance had to be able to look at whatever Norma the refinement god had pioneered and grasp every detail in the same way the refinement god had. For ego, be humble enough that you accept the work is below par and do everything you can to bring it to completion. Observation. Notice the truth and quintessence of the source material so that you can even replicate it at will. Likely, the next test would then be creativity. Creativity, to have the imagination to add the rest of the missing sections to complete the source material, backed by knowledge and talent, of course. This would be the final test and the final cutoff point. Draco wasn't guessing. Vishad and co. had told them the processes, but as stated before, they had no clue about the true purposes of these tests. Draco himself had been clueless until he heard the exact wording by the refinement god spirit. He didn't hear the wording for the third test, but he heard what the content was about. And if everything he had assumed till now was correct, it was likely that the third and final test would be about creativity coming full circle. Once Draco reached this understanding, his pinnacle intelligence switched off a de so too did his dark angel inheritance. Time, which had seemed to have stopped, suddenly resumed, and nothing had really changed since then. Well, there was one thing that did, the calm refinement god spirit that had been waiting for the candidates to begin envisioning the palace so as to sift through them was hit with Draco's rapid thoughts all of a sudden. After flickering questionably for a moment as it parsed his thoughts, it eventually froze, and if it had an expression, it would definitely display the extremity of disbelief and shock as it turned to face Draco, who displayed a Siowaki smile. Pinnacle Intelligence, Passive Skill Effect possess a thinking and reasoning capacity two times your current limit. Chapter 474 Norma the Refinement Goddess The Refinement God Spirit could no longer focus on any of the other candidates and their efforts to describe the palace. It was now fully enraptured by Draco in the sense that it marveled over his sharpness. He had successfully broken down everything about the test and what it was supposed to achieve with so little to go on to the point that there was no longer any point in testing him. As such, the refinement god's spirit announced, this millennium's competition will end here. Although there are quite a few viable candidates this time around, I have encountered someone most fitting for my purposes and will now vet them. Hearing this, the candidates and the mayors were both saddened and aggrieved deep down until a burst of hope and excitement lit up in their hearts. Who was it? Who was the lucky one to receive the inheritance of the Supreme Ancestor? This had never happened before. No one had ever passed the three tests and reached the vetting stage. Wait, they were still in the middle of the a second test. Who was the monster that made the Supreme Ancestor cancel it all just to speed things up? As the candidates buzzed and looked around to suss who it might be, Draco casually walked out, causing the excited crowd to freeze. They all watched his back his black cape billowing majestically in the wind as he walked towards the palace. The crowd would have, no, should have erupted in anger at this sight, but there was only silence. Whether it was the mayors or the candidates, they all felt suffocated, like something was squeezing the inner parts of their torsos lightly. Thoughts began to emerge in their heads, convincing them that this actually was the reality of the situation, and that it should have been obvious from the start killing their enthusiasm and the hope for their own protégés. Hoover and Vishad shared a meaningful look. Both of them had already seen Draco mentally suppress Evergreen Village's candidates and had been aware that he possessed such abilities, thinking that he would use them during the test to suppress his foes. However, the present situation in which he decided to showcase these abilities could be described as the best possible one. He had suppressed all possible dissent without even speaking a word. Even if the one chosen had not been him, by virtue of his current actions, they would be too weakened to even claim their rightful place and would have been forced watch on while Draco took it from them. Luckily, there was no issue here, since Draco was indeed the chosen one. He entered the strange palace with the refinement god's spirit one step ahead of him, merely turning his head slightly towards the crowd still outside. While only being able to see the side profile of his face, 
There was a short period of pause before Draco smirked mockingly. Right at that moment, the doors to the palace closed, cutting their view from the arrogant fellow. No matter the gender or race in the crowd, or even status, everyone was left feeling cheated and impotent, especially with how the fellow rubbed it in. There were just two people who rejoiced at this fellow's shamelessness, Hoover and Vishad. They felt like investors who watched their initial investment of a mere thousand dollars reap profits in the billions. Draco walked through the palace with the refinement god's spirit. He noticed that the deeper he went, the more bizarre the decorations. Clearly, this semi-origin god was talented in trade skills, because like any genius, they likely viewed the world in a different way. That was the only explanation he could think of for this bizarre aesthetic their habitat possessed. Soon enough, they reached what should be a private meeting room, which featured some sofas and a table. Draco plopped down on the visitor's sofa while the spirit seemed to place itself on the other side. Draco rubbed his hair and spoke first. So, Mr. A, refinement god, what do you want with the great me? The spirit squirmed, as if second-guessing if this was actually a good idea, then solidified into a concrete shape. It wasn't quite what Draco had expected, for it was a feminine figure that was quite average. That would be Miss Refinement Goddess, if anything, young hybrid. The spirit corrected him in a clearly female voice this time, unlike the genderless one it had used before. Draco observed the Refinement God, Refinement Goddess in silence. From the form she had taken, she was quite okay in terms of objective attractiveness. Clean skin, svelte form, not much of a backside and extremely modest bust, a sharp jaw, thin lips, a slightly hooked nose, and inclined eyes. Had she been any slimmer, she would have appeared like the old slim fatty. With her facial features, she seemed more like a scary strict librarian than a trade-skilled genius. Right, Miss Norma, so you called me here for? Draco replied casually. Norma pursued her lips but let the matter go. She had experienced enough of Draco's mind to understand what kind of person he was, and getting angry would just be shooting herself in the foot. I called you here to verify some things and clarify some others before I decide what to do with you next. Draco folded his arms slowly. Go ahead. Norma's eyes narrowed slightly. First off, what did you do to have a god's envoy visit you? Draco smirked. I basically copulated with the most exemplary women in the world. Our offspring, bearing the best parts of our genetics, were like beacons of potential and power. Norma's eyes twitched. She inspected Draco with suspicion, but saw that he was likely speaking the truth. It wasn't that far-fetched anyway, as the bloodline she sensed coursing through him was too potent. Fine. Secondly, what are you? You exist differently from the rest of the humans in this world. I might have been gone for an eternity, but it should be impossible for the humans on the main plane to evolve this much. We are called immortal adventurers. Feel free to think of us as profit-seeking visitors from a world higher than your divine world, and as superior forms of life, we've obtained the ability to respawn endlessly, Draco explained. Norma's lips twitched once more, but she could tell that, despite being altered somehow, it still carried some elements of truth. Rather, it was that Draco believed it to be genuinely true, and she sensed that from his mind. That should be acceptable. Lastly, for my final inquiry, how did you manage to acquire the location of the treasury's opening? This question was poisonous, as Norma radiated a feeling of being like a poised snake, ready to pounce as soon as the signal was given. Draco picked his ears lazily. Not long after I've entered this world, I managed to create a potion that allows one to gain 50% of a low-rank dragon source origin in an era where all dragons have gone extinct. As such, the powers that be decided that I was qualified to partake in this test. Despite the brewing tension from the structure of the question, Draco seemed unbothered. This irked Norma greatly, as they both knew the reason why this was so. Not only that, his answer was once again grounded in truth, as she had sensed something similar when she had first inspected his soul. With a weak sigh, Norma retracted her will to harm and silently stared at Draco. Draco also stared at her in utter silence, not moving an inch. Interestingly, they both maintained this kind of position for more than an hour straight until Norma's lips twitched and she gave in. How stubborn, she murmured unhappily. Draco simply smiled. 
Norma frowned. Fine, then I shall speak. I have made my various inquiries and now wish to clarify some things to you. Suddenly, Norma smiled ever so slightly and coldly. Firstly, bringing you here has nothing to do with me giving you my inheritance. As I said, I brought you here to make inquiries and clarify some things. Draco's nonchalant facade shattered as he frowned deeply while staring at the refinement goddess. She ignored his dissatisfaction and continued. Secondly, I was not killed by an enemy per se. Instead, it was by my own volition that I came here to die. Thirdly, and this is just my personal advice to you, but you should cut all contact with the divine world henceforth. You are clever and have learned a lot through tidbits, but unearthing what happened during the old war will not be beneficial to anybody, least of all for you. Believe me when I tell you that it's for the best if certain things remain forgotten in the past, for it might rekindle old fires and start a new one. Fourthly, I am aware that even if I attempt it, it will be impossible to wipe your memory after you've left this treasury, which puts me at risk of having unwanted parties learn about my heritage. Finally, if you truly want to carry my inheritance, I'm unable to deny the fact that you are capable enough and talented to actually achieve it. However, I do find your manners and personality lacking, so I have decided to hold off on that. Draco's frown deepened greatly as he dangerously rose to his feet, even as Norma continued speaking. In fact, I think that it'd be best if I destroyed your immortal spirit since it's the only alternative I have to wiping your memory. Norma simply gazed at the menacing Draco calmly. A semi-origin goddess, even one who could not really fight competently, was far too strong for a mere rank two entity. However, Draco was not too bothered internally. He had two trump cards up his sleeve, his immunity to destruction energy, and his bloodline. The former made it impossible to ever destroy his immortal spirit, as that would just nourish him, while the latter held secrets he wholeheartedly believed trumped anything in the world of Boundless. Even if he had to destroy this treasury by provoking something deadly out, he would do it. Whether Ophi, Natasha, and Ko would die was inconsequential, what was important was taking what he wanted when he wanted. As such, Draco stood over Norma and gazed at her imperiously. It was as if he was the one with the semi-origin level power, and Norma was a measly mortal reaching for more than she could grasp. Another point of clarification, Norma began with an amused tone. I don't need to use destruction energy against you. She finished as she pointed lightly towards Draco. The expression on his face changed as he felt his body convulse without his will. No, it was better to describe it as his body trying to crumple itself in order to prevent something from coming out. It's an interesting thing about you, immortal adventurers, that made me hone in on you and specifically ask you about it. Norma spoke casually. Draco fell to his knees and began sweating like he had just finished running a marathon, his body tearing itself apart as if something inside wanted to free itself. You might call it an immortal spirit, but it's far from that. Rather, it is a special spiritual core in your body where your organic soul should have been. Draco's eyes reddened in rage as he began channeling his bloodline. His bloodline was like a nuclear weapon, right? Then he would allow her to get a taste of what it was like. Instead of a soul, like the natives of this world have it, you possess a small, impure orb of origin energy that functions as such. It's no wonder you can revive endlessly with such a thing as your foundation. Draco's blood began to boil over, and he felt like he was going to explode. Destruction energy can eat away at any form of energy in the universe, so it should be your kind's only real weakness. However, Judging by your earlier calmness, you must have had a way to negate or absorb destruction energy, leading you to believe that you were infallible. Draco channeled it all into his serpent god inheritance. Every single bit of bloodline energy and source was burned at once, fueling this absurd action that would have consequences beyond anything anyone could imagine. Unfortunately for you, you must have been unaware of one vital thing about semi-origin gods. Extracting origin energy from external sources to nourish ourselves is how every semi-origin god, P, progresses. therefore you immortal adventurers are practically living tonics to us. Draco raised his head and grinned brutally at the refinement goddess. 
His rupturing body, red eyes, and evil grin chilled the heart of Norma as she felt an unprecedented crisis. Draco then unleashed the power he had kept at bay, the power he had concluded would be best to deal with this semi-origin god spirit. The Power of Nidhogg. Chapter 4475. Draco Strikes Back. Draco was desperate, enraged, and vengeful. A person with these traits would do anything necessary to achieve a certain goal or task, which in this case was not merely survival but the destruction of the one threatening him through consumption or appropriation. As he had once told Vishad, he loved the feeling of taking from others what was rightfully theirs, especially if they didn't like it. No, he had not always been like that, so it was likely another aspect of his personality amended by his bloodline. Unlike Eva, who fought every change, Draco usually went with the flow and accepted them. This led to him being able to manipulate and manifest his bloodline almost as well as Eva did, despite his soulmate having years more training than him. Their bloodlines had previously been described as nuclear weapons. Why? Well, one could picture it like this. In a common lineage member with, say, 5% bloodline purity, we could take it that each bloodline percentage represented a generator of energy, this energy being bloodline energy. This was why bloodline energy was usually similar in quantity and quality to their bloodline purity if calculating them numerically. So, how would a person with 5% purity go about becoming stronger? There were two ways. One was to achieve a sort of mastery over their inheritances by training them over and over again. While it was practically impossible to become a grandmaster, if one was to put it in boundless terms, it would nevertheless bring with it beneficial changes. Not only would it allow one to lower the cost of energy required to manifest their abilities, but it would also strengthen, augment those abilities through repeated use. The second way was to increase their bloodline energy quantity. This could not be achieved through simple training, but only through semi-unique Cirque Dime stances, the simplest one coming naturally through aging. Unlike in fictional depictions, blood, bloodlines only grew stronger with age as they assimilated with the body more through being exercised over the years. One could picture that at the age of childhood, those lineage members had a tiny rickety generator that could produce only so much energy for a period of time. Yet as they grew older and practiced fought more, more parts would be added to the small generator, expanding it to a medium-sized one, then a large-sized one, and so on, until whatever limits their bloodline purity placed upon them. Essence Stalker, for example, had a higher purity than Loving Ant, yet he could not muster anywhere near enough energy as she could. Loving Aunt could use any Serpent God inheritance technique except the ultimate ones with ease in the game and even in the real world, while Draco and Essence were still unable to fuel such abilities with ease even in the game, much less the real world. Another way to increase their energy reserves would be through repeated use of the atavism technique or its equivalent for all bloodlines and inheritances, but that was even more costly in the long term than using an ultimate technique. The final option would be through external help. Implantation, imbuing, appropriation, or other ways one could increase their energy count, the most common one being to steal a fellow clanmate's bloodline, although in recent years the help of science was also becoming popular. So then, what was up with Draco and Eva? Why were they described as nuclear when they should not have that much energy? The problem wasn't the fact that Draco and Eva were each at 99% bloodline purity nowadays, neither was it the fact that they had access to all three inheritances and more. No, the problem stemmed from their souls, their bloodline sources, and whatever the hell Lucifer had done put in them pre-creation. As such, they were not just clones, but more like a watered-down reincarnation in some aspect and a superior reincarnation in others. They did not have as much raw power as their original selves, but they had far more versatility and control. They essentially had a bet, or foundation. But this didn't change one core fact. They possessed a bloodline of the same quality, if not slightly better thanks to Lucifer's tweaks, than their originals. This meant that, theoretically, Draco and Eva had the same bloodline power as the original duo. This was what justified their nuclear weapon descriptor. If every percent of bloodline purity was one electrical generator in a normal lineage member, 
Then each bloodline percentage in Draco and Eva corresponded to something like a superfusion generator. No, even that was too small. It was more apt to describe the normal members with typical generators, while the duo would have engines capable of powering super-duper stars from sci-fi media. The question then was, why did Draco and Eva not have the ability to wipe out the Earth with a key ball or a Gallic gun? Well, the answer was that they could, just not yet. Quite a chilling fact overall. This was the reason they occasionally messed up with their bloodline. Following the above illustration on the limits of bloodline energy, their interstellar fusion generators, per percent of bloodline, were currently working at the lowest possible capacity. That was why they struggled to fuel any of their OP inheritances. It made no sense that they would have such powerful bloodlines, but would need external sources to do certain things. Otherwise, how did Lucifer and Amaterasu and the others manifest all of their inheritances' aspects into reality, each with their own life and power, thereby leaving different crazy mythologies down? Draco only realized this in the split second he had chosen to go all out, and he had realized even more than just that. He had gained an epiphany as to why Eva had created a hive mind. According to his new understanding, when she had been casting the small mental compulsion, one of her generators must have spiked in power, and just that extra bit had fed the ability creating that monstrosity. For it was crazy to believe that a mere mental compulsion could grow so strong in a mere seven days. Even if it were to realistically happen, it should have taken years and heaps of effort, as the hive mind had captured citizens, branched out one by one, and tried to blend into society while it gathered more. Seeing how their bloodline energy was created on such an atomic level had led Draco to all these assumptions and clarifications, though the facts he brushed through in the beginning were taught by Eva and Loving Ant. It was important to remember that, at that time, Eva had merely been a little bit annoyed, whereas Draco was currently on the verge of destruction. He was fueled by anger, desperation, and vengefulness, which had led to him burning all his bloodline energy and even almost all of his bloodline source, something he sparingly had given to his beloved kids because it would affect him in the outside world. Considering all that had been explained so far, coupled with the emotions running through Draco, not forgetting the actions he had taken to get to where he was at that moment, one did not need to be an Einstein to understand that a serious disaster was incoming. The only remaining question was, for who? It depended on how Draco manifested his bloodline, actually. He had had many options thanks to his various aspects, but very few would have been able to take down Norma, even in this dangerous state. Origin gods in this game were the equivalent of the nine original humans. A semi-origin god, even if it was just their spirit, was half of that. To jump from rank two to pose a threat to such a person was ridiculously hard, even with this bloodline eruption. It would certainly deal her damage, no doubt, but this world was not like Earth. In the outside's real universe, the bloodlines reigned supreme. Even Salo had outrightly stated that Draco had possessed some origin source of an alternate universe. However, Boundless was its own universe as well. Even if it was a mere game, it was structured well enough for Celo to mistake it for a legitimate digital world. As the saying goes, the foreign dragon cannot beat the local snake. Draco's bloodline was more powerful than anything Norma could muster, but it was unable to display that same amount of power in Boundlesses compared to if he had done the same outside. However, as the reincarnation of Lucifer, he is shameless, evil, bastardly, amoral, and generally incorrigible. How could such a fellow not be scheming? How could he not have known the futility of his efforts? As such, he had cleverly placed his bets on one of his aspects that were coincidentally perfect for dealing with such matters. He had chosen the evil dragon, Needhog. Loving Ant had once said, You can drain the life energy, or any other form of energy, from any living entity with Needhog's evil energy drain. This was a serpent that was believed to be able to sap the tree of life, Yggdrasil, of its fundamental essence. Draco was truly insidious. He had listened to the refinement goddess harp on about how her kind was capable of draining external origin energies to fuel their essence, and how he had been naive for thinking she couldn't do the same to him. So Draco had simply thought 
that it would be interesting to see who could absorb and assimilate better. Nidhogg the evil dragon, who had even conquered the legendary Tree of Life, or Norma, a mere spirit of a semi-origin god. It only took an instant for the answer to show itself. The horrid jerking of Draco's body came to an abrupt stop, as he panted while on his knees. He slowly receded most of his armor into his body and sat back on the sofa while sweating lightly. His body slowly healed itself of its wounds thanks to his draconic superiority passive skill which made HP regen permanently active, among other boons. As Draco slowly came down from the adrenaline and the pressure, his panting also subsided slowly. He gazed over at Norma silently, contemplating what to do with this spirit next. As for Norma, she remained quietly seated in a very noble posture, like a young maiden talking to her father in the meeting room. This wasn't due to her will, though Norma did look stately in this posture. No, she was forced to sit like this, as there was a long serpentine dragon winding around her form tightly. This dragon was quite ugly, there were no two ways about it. Draco would not dare to call Nidhogg handsome, even by draconic standards. It had shady purple eyes, two long white dragon whiskers, and a misshapen snout. Its body was long, thick, and quite spiky. Its scales were dirty black, not pristine like those of a black dragon. Nidhogg looked like a nefarious swindler who one could not trust, at least by draconic standards. In human and non-draconic eyes, it looked extremely deadly and menacing. The only reason why Norma would remain still in the grasp of such a beast was because the head of Nidhogg had pierced through her spiritual body and was on the cusp of consuming her soul. Draco had only stopped it at the last second, preventing Norma from becoming a thing of the past, permanently. Right now, both parties were trapped in an awkward situation where the outcome was inevitable, but it was as if someone had pressed pause on the remote while they had gone off to take a bathroom break. Draco stared at Norma silently for a few more seconds before he spoke. You know, I didn't understand at first. There were still many holes in my theory about your demise and how this inheritance came to be. Now that our positions are reversed, I shall inquire on a few things and then clarify some for you. The first inquiry I have is, why? Draco asked with visible confusion. Norma made no change to her expressions as she clarified. Why what? Why would you directly jump to hostilities against someone who clearly means no harm to you? You were privy to my thoughts and rationale for being here, yet you actually tried to dispose of me because you believed a memory wipe, which you have not even attempted, might not work. Draco asked with a frown. Norma looked at him silently before sighing. I might be a ghost, but that has not changed me being a semi-origin god and you being a rank two mortal. You're in my treasury, partaking in my test. Whatever I decide to do with you is my purview. Draco's lips twitched. That was one confirmation down. Now to make two more. Second inquiry. Who told you to set up this inheritance and why? Chapter 4 and 6, The Harsh Truth. Norma was silent for a bit before answering slowly. It was the origin gods of the various trade skills. They had communed and assisted me in preparing the treasury, going so far as to hide it from prying eyes, as well as preserving my legacy. She said this with a lot of pride. Then again, it was clearly justified. Who in this world could claim to have the unconditional support of any origin god, much less that many? Even Draco had only met two who simply favored him a little. What they had done for him and what they had done for Norma were leagues apart. However, Draco exhaled through his nose lightly, unsure about what to say after he asked his third question. You have not really answered the and why, Draco pointed out. According to them, there would be a war happening between the various gods in the divine world it would even affect those mortals of the main plane. It was going to be a disaster of epic proportions, and due to how close I was to completing my path, they couldn't allow me to be harmed since many factions had their eyes set on me. As such, we'd brought all my descendants here and created this treasury. The tests were only added in later, when I felt my natural lifetime coming to an end due to the lack of organic energy. Norma waved her hands lightly. What you see and feel to be potent energy in here is basically from me shedding my corporal body, not a natural occurrence of this treasury. If you want to understand this in simplified terms, if I were a mortal, 
I had been slowly dying from asphyxiation, Norma concluded. Draco nodded. Her example was apt. It certainly sounded as if her situation was not too different from someone who had been buried alive. Sure, such a person would have oxygen to last them a while, but the longer they stayed inside, the more it would be converted into carbon dioxide, which was not exactly the favored palate of the lungs. In her case, it was energy. She radiated divine, etheric, worldly, and origin energy that had eventually filled up the treasury and had increased the quality of life for all residents here. But those were her exhalations. Since she kept breathing them back in, it had ruined her until her life came to an end, at which point she must have transferred her consciousness into this spirit form. However, why had she called it a natural end, though? Who would ever think that a mighty god could perish because they ran out of oxygen? Final inquiry. Why did you not leave the treasury occasionally to get fresh energy? Draco asked solemnly. I had done that every now and then at first, but I was forced to stop after I felt many eyes on my person. The last time I headed out, I was almost killed, and if it hadn't been for the intervention of the origin gods at the last second, my enemies might have discovered the location of the treasury as well. Norma recounted with a heavy expression. This. Draco sputtered as he was left utterly speechless. He couldn't believe this. This was something he would never have dared to think if the facts didn't conveniently align themselves together in this angle. This was utterly crazy. Scandal. This was a huge scandal. Draco slumped into his seat and began sweating in silence. He was unsure whether to reveal the truth of everything or to let Norma die in ignorance. However, he decided to let her know in the end. After all, despite trying to delete him, she was still about to give her inheritance to him in its totality. This was the least he could do as thanks for the great boons he would be enjoying henceforth. Draco sighed and rose to his feet. He gazed at Norma for a long second, while the refinement goddess looked back with an almost blank expression, like she was unbothered by any of this. Madam Norma, forgive me for my behavior towards you up until now. I've only acted that way due to the confidence I had in being the only one to fit your requirements in all these years. Norma was alarmed. She had an elementary understanding of this fellow's personality, yai, and knew that for him to apologize like this, he must have seen or learned something about her that garnered his pity. Hybrid Draco, what are you trying to say? Norma asked uncertainly. Draco took in a deep breath and began. Norma, after hearing your story, I can only come to one conclusion. You likely were never hunted by any true gods. Even if you had been, they likely could have never harmed you. I do not know exactly what your trade skill path is, except that it must have to do with refinement. This, to those in the know, is a field so valuable that they had been willing to do anything to acquire it. The origin gods themselves valued your path but could not claim it, because they already have their attributes and, correct me if I am wrong, they can only have one of those. Norma seemed lost, but still nodded. Yes, this is the barrier that stops all semi-origin gods. Some, like me, have gathered huge amounts of origin energy over time due to our particular attributes skill, but still cannot become origin gods precisely because we haven't yet perfected that attribute skill in question. Draco nodded. So in other words, they had to raise the rank of their path attribute to origin rank. That would give them the origin combat rank. Then, with the origin energy they accumulated, they could kickstart an origin grade source origin and produce origin energy naturally. Sounded simple enough on paper, but Draco could feel the intense struggle Norma and her kind must have gone through to even achieve semi-origin rank. No, they should be called quasi-origin. Semi-origin would mean that they either had a genuine origin-grade source origin that produced origin energy naturally, or they had carried an attribute to the origin rank, giving them the ability to actually use the power, but still lacked the other. It's here the distinction should be brought forth. Combat rank origin rank would mean that the entity in question could utilize skills spells of that grade, and the power they manifested would naturally be of that grade as well. A simple punch would be origin rank. A sneeze would be origin rank. Any item created through a trade skill at that same grade would be origin rank as well. 
However, the source origin slash state of being denoted the ability to generate the purest energy of that rank organically. Your blows might not be origin rank, but the power fueling them would be, meaning that they would morph into something greater. To put it simply, combat rank actual rank was like the engine vehicle while the source origin state of being was like the fuel. For the purpose of this example and clarification, if one put top tier fuel in a shitty car, it would make that shitty car move faster and better at its own expense. If one had a high tier supercar but used shitty fuel, it might move quickly but its performance would be lacking for a car of that standard. Draco rounded up his thoughts and got back to the matter at hand. As the origin gods themselves were unable to claim your special and much desired path, the next best thing would be to make sure the person practicing it would be in their good books. I'm assuming they showered you with much love and attention. Norma was still lost as to where this was going, but her heart began to thump. A fear that surpassed the one of death started to raise its ugly head inside her, an emotion so suffocating and visceral that she found herself speaking in almost a trance. They did. Even though it had led to great instability at times, they would take turns to briefly pause their eternal work to help me along my way or warn me of dangers, also granting me many boons. Even though my path allowed me to gather a lot of origin energy, I would have to admit that many of the resources you see in this treasury had been bestowed on me by them. Draco wiped his forehead lightly and smacked his lips with discomfort. This was making him feel very bad. Really, really bad. I see. And what about you? How did you interact with them? How did you treat them? Norma paused in Rimpa, inist. In the beginning, I was eternally grateful for their assistance. It was a heaven-sent help to me who had been far from divinity back then and had only begun trudging along my long and arduous path. However, it soon became too much. They wanted to monitor me at all times and always checked over my shoulders. It didn't take long for me to become quite annoyed with them, though I initially didn't dare to show it. However, the more powerful I became and the closer I came to reaching my goal, the less I paid them any respects. I was a semi-origin god on the cusp of upgrading. Not to mention my path was the foundation of all of theirs and was superior in every way. Norma smiled thinly. Had I become a true origin goddess, I could have handled the work of over 10,000 origin gods. Many of them could have taken a break to experience what it's like to live. They needed me to achieve that goal, and I had been aware of that. As such, I had stopped letting them lead me around by the nose. Draco hiccuped. Shit. While that is absurdly amazing, I fear that I have to correct you first. From all you've told me, a path or attribute can be developed by any person and brought to the origin rank. Your particular path would see that the work of the origin gods would be reduced greatly, and as such, they had invested heavily in you but also wanted to control you, which you resisted ultimately, correct? Norma frowned. Yes, that is an apt summary. What's the issue? Draco shook his head. No, pay attention to my wording. A path or attribute can be developed by any person. Draco gazed at the refinement goddess as calmly as he could. What the origin gods need most is a fellow origin god who can use your developed path of refinement at that rank. That fellow origin god doesn't need to specifically be you. Norma froze. Her mind quaked at the revelation Draco pushed onto her and her breathing hitched. The fear that had been quietly building up and simmering was beginning to show signs of exploding. Draco continued to hammer down. You've never received a direct threat or so much as a warning from any other true god during that time, have you? From what you've told me, the ones to inform you about everything were the origin gods. You must have believed them, because why would such being lie to you? But think about it, which true god would have the balls to challenge a semi-origin god? Sigurd and his pantheon. They only got lucky because they had a weapon specifically meant to cull dragons, and Sigurd had slowly built up his power by killing weaker ones before climbing up the hierarchy. Who would even try to kill you? At that time, you were the favored deity that the origin gods had been grooming, someone whose path meant so much to the current origin gods that they'd gone so far as to take breaks from their eternal duty. Who would dare? Why couldn't they simply protect you? 
there is no such excuse as something preventing them from intervening. When the Ultima Sunt race had been showing signs of being a threat, wasn't it an origin god who had punched down and extinguished the entire race? Why couldn't they simply do the same to the offending true gods? The answer is because there had never been anyone to strike in that situation. They had noticed you growing rebellious, so they wanted someone other than you to reach the origin rank. For that, they must have waited until you were on the cusp of achieving it before executing their plan. Naturally, they couldn't just tell you to die and leave an inheritance. What if you got enraged and destroyed everything? Then where would they cry to? Their best option was to convince you to lock yourself away and then trick you into killing yourself. Upon reaching death, your instincts as a trade skill master would force you to make sure that you would look for someone to continue to finish your lifetime's work. Then, as if they had predicted it, they assisted you in setting up an inheritance for future generations to inherit your work. It would take time and a lot of luck to find someone as talented as you in trade skills to finish your path. The probability was low and the time it would take could range from the very first inheritance competition to 70 million years later, if not longer. But what is time to origin gods who have existed since the beginning of time itself and are beings equal to the universe? Were they wrong for waiting? After all, a being like me had appeared eventually, a perfect replacement for you. Hence, two origin gods nonchalantly blessed me in order to win my favor as they deduced that I would likely be your next inheritor. Chapter 477 The End of Norma Norma reacted as anyone who heard that their guardians had betrayed them would. Her face paled and she shook her head from side to side. Instant denial which was inescapable. Who would simply believe the accusation of a stranger that the ones who had been smiling at them all the time could have been waiting for an opportunity to stick a knife in their back? However, words did not come out of her mouth, for Norma was not an idiot. She knew more of the details than Draco, who had mostly used speculation and deduction to fill in the gaps. As such, she had a much greater insight into what Draco had been describing than even he did. Norma was drowned by a feeling of despair so great that she began to ventilate, despite not being a living being that needed to breathe. Still, she subconsciously needed a way to vent her growing desolation, and mimicking something she would have done were she alive was a sad attempt at doing so. Draco remained silent and watched her go through the motions. Norma was a semi-origin god, so her mental fortitude was much greater. The average person would go through the five stages of denial, anger, bargaining, despair, and acceptance. However, Norma had directly skipped over her anger and bargaining phase because her logical nature as a trade skill goddess forced her to understand the reason behind it, only leaving despair that something so cruel had been done to her. In the end, Norma sighed and gazed at Draco. She had gone from denial to acceptance in under a minute. Draco wasn't sure whether he should be impressed or terrified over the adaptability of Norma. Draco had originally pegged her for a Sunna version 2.0, but clearly he had been looking down on her too much. One question, how did you realize your earlier conclusion, which we both mutually accepted, was flawed? Norma asked silently. Draco twisted his lips before sighing and answering her bluntly. I came to the realization when you answered my first question. Why would you want to kill me? Your answer told me all I needed to know about your train of thought. And so I thought, if I were an origin god, why would I bother protecting or nurturing someone who thinks like this? Draco shrugged lightly. After that, I just needed more information to that end, which you yourself provided me. Norma was stunned. You mean to say that the reason they wanted to replace me wasn't because I was hard to control, but because you all feel I'm insufferable? Draco nodded weakly. You being hard to control or not is really just a side thing. They need you to alleviate their burden, which you would be compelled to do as a new origin god. They don't even need to directly order you around to do so. However, no one wants to be in the same workplace as an insufferable person, especially if it would be for eternity, even if they are very productive and useful. They seem to have chosen to rather suffer it out than have to deal with that. Norma was left speechless. This was something she struggled to come to terms with, 
because she had originally reconciled with the fact that their actions had stemmed from their dislike caused by her insubordination. In other words, a logical standpoint. However, Draco was now telling her that their actions and this elaborate plan must have been created for an emotional reason, which absolutely floored her. Draco remained silent for a while longer to allow the refinement goddess to process his words. After a while, she became calm once again and nodded towards Draco. I have two questions before I'll allow your incarnation consume me. The first is, shouldn't you be wary of the origin god's response after telling me this? I assume they would rather I died ignorant and you remained clueless of all these facts to make for a smooth transition. Draco smiled at this. It was a guess I made after comparing some data. When I was first brought before Copernico, he had initially wanted to go through the formal processes and get rid of me as soon as possible. However, a cursory scan show D him more about me. From this, I've learned two things. The first is that origin gods appear to be too busy with their perennial work to focus on the happenings of every life form. Secondly, they are not omniscient. Copernico had to assess me before my features became clear to him, and he did not know I'd appeared from within your treasury straight away. Of course, either of these guesses might have been right or wrong, but one thing that had made me certain of it was when you stated your behavior towards the origin gods. Someone who had started to despise their way of looking over their shoulder would not leave their eternal resting place open for peeking. Draco leisurely folded his arms. In other words, it assured me that nothing that occurs in the treasury is visible to the origin gods unless you allow them to see it. Norma tilted her head upward slightly, trying to hide the hint of praise in her glance. On that matter, you are right. The reason you haven't been struck into non-existence for blasphemy the very second you dared utter something like that is because you're here, or more specifically, with me. Draco shuddered internally. If he garnered the ire of the origin gods, his life wouldn't be peaceful at all. While he and Eva might dare to disdain true gods because they knew the truth, they could not dare to do so against the topmost echelon. If the former could be likened to pseudo-GMs, then the latter would basically be the game's developers, capable of actually drop down the banhammer on his head. Final question. What do you plan to do with my inheritance? Norma asked in a muted tone. Draco's eyebrows locked, and he frowned. You've already seen into my mind, Norma. I want your inheritance to experience trade skills even better and climb even higher. I want to bring crafting in general to new levels, and it sounds like your inheritance is the path towards achieving that. Norma shook her head lightly. You're underestimating my path. This is something that even the origin gods have gone this far for in terms of preservation. Its power and utility are far beyond what you can imagine, hybrid Draco. I have full confidence that with your talent, you will eventually complete my path before you, if I remember correctly, intend to head to other worlds through the Void Realm. You might even be able to take it further and refine it by assimilating it with the various systems in other universes. Norma admitted honestly. However, that is not what I am asking. When you complete the path and reach the pinnacle, what will you do with my true inheritance? Norma asked Draco while staring him in the eye. Draco finally understood what she was trying to say. With a heavy tone, he elaborated. For your descendants, I plan to take them as my people and habituate them into my fledgling city-state. With the benefits of Vita city-state and their talent, they will simply soar to heights thought impossible in the main plane. For your resources, I plan to take exclusive control over them and nurture them in small worlds. They are the topmost quality, as well as the rarest of the rare in the current era. They have to be cultivated carefully. I would change it so they would only be used by the best of the best when making new or objectively useful products. Allowing amateurs to practice with them is supremely wasteful. For your items, well, I don't know exactly what I will get, but I assume I will use them to the best of my ability and otherwise share them with those I deign worthy. For your path, you already know. However, you can rest at ease. I have no intention of joining those fellows in that courtyard whatsoever. Norma hesitated for a bit, before sighing. I can accept that then. As I said before, 
I cannot give you my inheritance that traditional way because I don't like your overall personality, but I will bestow you with the knowledge on how to claim it after consuming me. Here. She flicked her finger, and a small white ball of light flew over to Draco and entered his forehead. He watched his happen calmly without trying to avoid it, and closed his eyes to digest what she had sent. When he opened them, his eyes revealed complex emotions. Goodbye, Norma. May your soul rest in perfect peace. Norma smiled and lowered her head while closing her eyes. Thank you, Hybrid Draco. May the world tremble beneath your feet and convulse at the thought of your might. And then, as if the one who had pressed the pause button came back and switched to play, the vile dragon Nidhogg clamped its mouth shut over Norma's essence, using a skill in place of Draco, one that he had saved for just such an occasion. Subsume 1. Once Nidhogg consumed Norma, her spirit waned and flickered out of existence like a poor quality light, her posture remaining the same till the end. Draco, however, shivered and sat down as Nidhogg roared and rushed back into his body. Norma had been a semi-origin god, and the quality of her essence was not something he could digest easily. As such, Nidhogg had felt it would be wiser to return to Draco and use the energy to replace his consumed bloodline source. This act allowed Draco to recover 10%. Draco then spent the next three days converting the essence within Norma, which was like origin energy, but not into bloodline source. He couldn't move the energy outwardly due to how his skill worked, so he had no choice but to utilize it for such a purpose, though there were many other things he could have used it for. Ultimately, Draco only managed to restore 30% of his bloodline source with 90% of Norma's essence, which left him speechless and his face black. He decided to use the last 10%, not on his bloodline, but his Dragrugio armor to evolve it by one rank. Draco felt this endeavor would yield much more benefits as he managed to easily raise the armor from the epic rank to the legendary rank. He put aside checking the changes to its skills and power just yet, as he was left confused by the quality difference between using the essence for his bloodline and his armor. It made no sense. Why did a whole 90% of a semi-origin god's fundamental essence yield so little bloodline energy, only about one-third in terms of percentile quantity? Suddenly, Draco shivered as he realized something he had been ignoring all this while. So far, his connection with the world of Boundless, which had been inexplicable since he first experienced it, had been largely one way. He could use his real-life resources to strengthen himself or interact with the game world. The same was true for many others like Kieran, who could bring his mother's Sarira into the game world and have her experience the game world, which should have been impossible. Due to his own experience, Draco had for the longest time believed that this was how it fundamentally worked, but he forgot one key detail. The connection wasn't one way. He should have known this because in the past, the eyes of Kalo were an item within the game that had helped him loosen the seal on his bloodline, which he eventually broke in the real world. He had forgotten about that precisely because he broke it open in the real world, but it didn't change the fact that it had all started within the game world. Heck, even Clarent, a digital entity, had interacted with his legitimate soul. And more recently, when he performed the ascension ceremony, his blood had taken on a slightly golden hue thanks to the strengthening from the horned demon inheritance. Because it had been minuscule, he also subconsciously ruled that out. However, this current matter was huge. Thinking back to it, it was actually a large oversight on his part. After all, he had always been burning bloodline source in this game to empower his kids with his most important wives, but no matter whether it was he or Eva, they had always needed to go to the real world to recover it. Nothing in-game had worked. But this time, Draco could feel his actual bloodline source recovering from using essence in the game. It didn't matter how inefficient it was, this was huge news. It answered one of his and Eva's by suggest fears, which was the fact that they would be able to acquire replenishment for the bloodline sources from anywhere else after first grade new smoothies wore off on them. Draco then flinched again. Thinking like that, first-grade new smoothies were able to recover more bloodline source than even the essence of a semi-origin goddess. In that moment, 
Draco asked himself the question that Eva and literally everyone else who had ever drunk first-grade new smoothies always did. What the hell was even used to make those drinks? Subsume, active skill effect, store the mass, energy, and soul of an entity consumed by you. Note, up to 10 entities can be stored at rank 2. Cooldown, one day. Chapter 478. The Inheritance 1. Draco put these questions aside for now. As for the matter about the poor conversion efficiency, he assumed that it had to do with how he was using in-game resources to affect real-life resources. For example, it was easy for a player to bring something from outside in due to the system controlling this digital world, so it could replicate whatever the player wanted to bring in 100%. The amazing thing was that it didn't stop there. Update 4 would allow players to use the pods to make digital replicas of things from the real world. But at the end of the day, Boundless was still a VRMRPG. Scientists might be working hard on making virtual things a reality, but that technology had not yet sailed. Even Boundless hadn't been capable of that for the entirety of the previous timeline. So for digital energy to affect the generation of bloodline source in the real world was like trying to 3D print a starship in sci-fi movies. However, using the same example, the starship had actually been printed and while not all of it had come out, the parts that did were functional enough for scientists to dissect and build a real one from it. It was basically an impossibility. Draco sighed and checked out his upgraded Dragorugio set to see what changed. Dragorugio, one-handed sword, optimal, infused, rank legendary, evolvable. Durability, 1,000,000, 1,000,000. 1, Effects, passive one, destructive aura, this sword deals 50% destruction energy with every attack. Passive 2, Darkness Aura. This sword inflicts a random supreme debuff on a target with each strike, up to a limit of 3. Active 1, Dark Fires. Cover the blade in a blackish miasma that is a mixture of destruction energy and darkness energy for 2 minutes. Cooldown, 5 minutes. Dragorugio, Chestplate, Optimal, Infused. Rank, Legendary, Evolvable. Durability, 1,000,000, 1,000,000. Effects, Passive 1, Reverse Scale, covering the key weakness of a black dragon. This item allows no harm to come to the reverse scale while equipped. Passive 2, Absorption. This item automatically absorbs ambient worldly energy to empower the user in all aspects. Active 1, Destruction Barrier. Create a barrier of destruction energy that negates 50% of incoming damage for 5 minutes. Cooldown, 1 minute. Dragorugio Pauldrons 2 Optimal, Infused. Durability, 1000,000, 1000,000 rank, Legendary, Evolvable. Passive 1 Resistance, Physical and Magical Resistance are increased by 70%. Passive 2 Defense, Physical and Magical Defense are increased by 70%. Active 1 Energy Gather, Drag in a torrent of worldly energy that reduces the cooldown of all of the set equipment's active skills. Cooldown, 3 minutes. Dragorugio, Arm Guards 2, Optimal, in Durability, 1000,000,000 Rank, Legendary, Evolvable. Effects, Passive 1, Speed Boost, Attack Speed is increased by 70%. Passive 2, Technique Supplement, All attack-based techniques are empowered by 30% and cost 50% less resources to use. Active 1, Rapid Hands, Drastically increase attack speed by 250% for 30 seconds. Cooldown, 2 minutes. Dragorugio, Knee Guards 2, Optimal, Infused. Durability, 1000,000 rank, Legendary, Evolvable. Effects, Passive 1, Speed Aura, Movement Speed is increased by 70%. Passive 2, Technique Boost, All movement-based techniques are empowered by 30% and cost 50% less resources to use. Active 1, Rapid Legs, Drastically increase movement speed by 250% for 30 seconds. Cooldown, 2 minutes. Dragorugio Set Equipment 5 Piece, Optimal, Infused. Rank Legendary, Evolvable Effect, with 2 pieces equipped, grants the passive skill Black Dragon's Heritage, Rank 2. With 3 pieces equipped, plus 70,000 HP. With 4 pieces equipped, plus 2,000% damage. With 5 pieces equipped, grants the active skill Black Dragon's Roar, Rank 2. Black Dragon's Heritage Passive Skill, Rank 2, 100% Source Origin of a Medium-Ranked Black Dragon. Black Dragon's Roar, Active Skill, Rank 2. Effect, send out a sound wave containing elements of Destor 
Uction that boosts damage dealt by the user by 600% over a distance of 400 miles. Cooldown, 8 minutes. Draco nodded with satisfaction. Most of the old skills, like the first passives and the active skills, had seen a boost in strength by about double their original values, which was logical for an entire grade increase. As for the new second passives for each weapon, they were quite useful. Darkness Aura let him smack supreme debuffs on an enemy, and up to three of them, so something like decaying, silenced, weakened, blinded, deafened, etc. Absorption fixed Draco's previously biggest combat flaw, his inability to use worldly energy in tandem with his combat skills. It had been the reason why he had made the Mana Sword in the previous lifetime. That flaw had already been fixed after learning subjective magic and advancing his control to Tier 4. Still, this passive absorption had two hidden effects, Draco identified. The first was that it would increase the quantity of ether crystals he made slightly, and the second was that anything he crafted would be 10% easier to make and would be 10% better than before. Two very nice boons overall. As for defense, it just increased his already high physical and magical defense. But hey, more was good, right? Now, enemies who could have done damage to him would have to settle for either dealing 9 as 1 or 0. As for technique supplement and technique boost, they basically made his attack and movement skills slightly better. As for the resource reduction, it was overshadowed by his demonic might passive skill. Still, they were useful as well. Satisfied with his gain so far, Draco then closed his eyes and focused on the instructions Norma had left him with. He had already spent over four days in total within her palace, so there was no need to rush. Those outside had long dispersed. Only Vishad and Hoover had not dared to leave in fear of being captured and interrogated by the other mayors. Those fellows had given them the stink eye as they had left, cursing the duo since they had lucked out by the inheritor appearing in their village first. In no time, Draco had finally come to terms with what Norma left him. It wasn't hard with Pinnacle Intelligence running, as well as his base Dark Angel inheritance buffs to his mental acuity. He smiled wistfully. She wasn't so bad after all, just a bit prude and stuck up. If she had been alive, one blissful night should have fixed all those characteristics and made her much more pleasant. Unfortunately, the origin gods had dealt with her, so that she had deteriorated until just a spirit was left behind that had Norma's memories and some of her essence. That was right. What Draco had absorbed had not been the full deal. That should have been obvious, though, as Norma had told him that her original body had turned into the energy spreading throughout the entire treasury. Draco shook his head. It wasn't the treasury, but rather Norma's small world. What existed out there did not qualify as a treasury compared to what existed here in the core zone of the small world. Draco stood up and used Species Shift to emulate Norma's source origin. This had been his original plan if Norma refused to cooperate, but he was glad she ended up cooperating. Still, Draco used this as it would make things much smoother overall. Immediately, Draco's existence mirrored Norma's, and he felt many things reach out and connect to him. Premier among this was the control of the treasury as a whole, which allowed Draco to see everything inside the small world. He could see Vishad and Hoover waiting anxiously. He could see Evergreen Manor bustling as his chosen concubines excitedly prepared for their new life, while those who had rejected his offer either didn't mind or were crying due to the missed opportunity. He saw Ophi dancing happily at the news while Doris nodded her head with a smile. As for Natasha, she was still locked in her room and Draco could see that she was on the cusp of reaching Grandmaster. She had fulfilled four of the five requirements, and oh, Inlai needed to formulate her Grandmaster technique. Thanks to her following Draco around while he had enlightened everybody, she had a much easier time of this. Draco took back his attention and rubbed his chin. He walked through the palace slowly and took in the bizarre aesthetic once more. Yet strangely, it seemed less and less so the more he looked at it. Either he was adapting to it, or he was beginning to be influenced by Norma's tastes. Whatever the case, Draco found that the whole design wasn't as jarring as it had been when he had first laid eyes upon it. He eventually reached the center of the palace, which instead of being a throne room, was a workroom. Unlike typical workrooms, though, 
this one had no tools. Heck, it wasn't even placed inside a super mini small world. Draco only knew this was a workroom because Norma had called it so in the instructions she had left behind. To his eyes, this looked more like a relaxing living room with the sofas, rocking chair, and plenty of windows that showed lovely scenery outside. Draco's lips twitched. At the end of the day, Norma was an old being after all. She definitely had some granny-like habits, and this workroom betrayed all of them. He moved across the workroom to a small chest placed by the side of her rocking chair. Draco easily picked it up and inspected it. Norma's Legacy Chest Unique Item Rank Origin Description This chest contains the full inheritance of Norma Rastia, Goddess of Refinement. It contains a myriad of items at the Divine and Origin Grade meant for her successor to use to complete the Path of Refinement. Note, some items can only be claimed at certain ranks and at certain milestones. Draco's breathing hitched as he read the description for it. Norma had warned him that the items within were of the highest quality, but seeing this description state there would legitimately be origin-grade items within made Draco shiver. So far, the existence of origin-grade items had only been a theory, a myth of the highest grade. Seeing confirmation that such items existed made him excited for the future. However, he had to be sure. As such, Draco opened the chest and was beholden to the items within. Congratulations on opening. One Norma's Legacy Chest rewards, five Origin Crystals, only one accessible, three Supreme Enlightenment Scrolls, none accessible, three Warding Scrolls, none accessible, one Deed to a Small World, accessible, one Refinement Goddess Token, accessible, one Refinement Path Trade Skill Book, accessible, one Pseudo Origin Grade Source Origin, none accessible. Draco Chest heaved. Putting aside the rest of the stuff, what made his knees shake were the Origin Crystals. These were the highest grade of crystals energy available in the entire universe. He had longed to gain something like this, not just to own it, but to use on one of his items, which had recently become two. The first was the Etzkaim seedling, and the second was something Eva had acquired, the seed of Yggdrasil. Infusing those two with the purest origin energy would give them the highest possible starting points, which was vital since they were arguably Draco's most important possession within Boundless, especially considering the future. However, the lack of accessibility irked him, but he understood why Norma had done so. In the instructions she had left, she had already hinted that the existence of these items and their purpose going forward Nothing put here was specifically there for personal use. They were all put there to help Draco complete Norma's path and become an origin god. First things first, Draco was supposed to claim the Refinement Path trade skill book and learn it, as it was the foundation for everything going forward. Draco also planned to claim the deed to the small world and the single origin crystal he could withdraw. Before all of that though, Although he would have to wait to retrieve them, he decided that it wouldn't hurt to inspect the details of each item as they came up in order to have a better grasp on what they did. After all, Norma had only told him when and how to use them, but wasn't too specific on what exactly they did. Chapter 479, The Inheritance 2 Supreme Enlightenment Scroll, Consumable Rank Divine, 100% Effectiveness, Effect Activate this scroll to gain a potent period of intense enlightenment in whatever topic you are researching for one week. Warding Scroll, Consumable Rank Origin, 100% Effectiveness, Description. Activate this scroll to prevent all existences at or below the origin rank from seeing your activities for one month. Refinement Goddess Token, Miscellaneous Rank, Divine Description, the symbol and authority of the Refinement Goddess, Norma. With this, one is able to lay claim to all her rights and privileges within the Supreme Pantheon. Refinement, Divine Trade Skill Effect. Learn how to convert material from one form to another at will. Draco was lost for words. The origin crystals and the deed to the small world did not need any clarification from him in terms of what they did and could do. The former was a potent energy source, and the latter was obviously the ownership to this small world he was currently in. As for the pseudo-source origin, he also knew what that was thanks to Norma. However, the item descriptions he had checked just now blew his mind, completely overshadowing the ones he was already familiar with. Technically, 
there wasn't that much content in Norma's legacy chest. However, Draco was aware that he was holding the greatest wealth and capital he had ever earned in his two lives combined. The Supreme Enlightenment scrolls had an obvious use, and the timing for which he was to utilize them had been strictly set by Norma. Even better were the warding scrolls, which Norma had prepared for Draco for those crucial moments when he was about to break through, so no one would disturb him. The refinement goddess's token might seem the least useful, but it was not. If Draco were to find passage to the divine world, something he knew Eva had already put on to her agenda, he would instantly change from a visitor invader to a council member with Norma's token, regardless of whether the other gods liked it or not. But what really sent him to Cloud Nine was the trade skill Norma had passed down, Refinement. All this time, Draco had been hearing Refinement God this and Refinement Goddess that, all praising her for being an unprecedented genius without anything clear to go by. The energy converter he had received possessed the description of being Norma's first tool for her trade skill path. So with that in mind, he had developed the idea that hers had to be a fundamental trade skill that would carry across all others. Something that likely helped increase the quality of raw materials used in crafting. For example, if someone with this trade skill was also a blacksmith, they would be able to refine their iron ore into the highest quality iron ingot with ease, far surpassing what Mjolnir could do even at its legendary rank. Like this example, in Draco's mind at least, the trade skill should have been an auxiliary slash support one that boosted the effectiveness of all others. How wrong and stupid he had been. Why would the origin gods care about something like that? If refinement had merely been a trade skill that could enhance all others through support, they would have given Norma a pat on the back and some encouraging words at best, not sacrifice so much to raise her before stabbing her in the back ultimately. No, the path of refinement was something else, something grander. The system of Boundless may have dubbed it refinement, but anyone from Earth would know that this was the much-desired and supremely respected ability of transmutation, the ability to turn any metal into gold, water into wine, coal into brick. It was about changing the fundamental properties and characteristics of an item in such a way that science deemed impossible and even alchemy found treasonous. It was believed that only the legendary item, the Philosopher's Stone, could perform this amazing ability, but Norma had found a way to make herself into a living Philosopher's Stone. F. Uke, no wonder the origin god's H. had been all over her. With this, if Norma had actually succeeded in reaching origin rank, she could have basically taken common worldly energy or any other form of energy to convert it upwards to origin energy with ease. She wouldn't even have to use her naturally generated origin energy like the others, and her companion origin gods would have been able to get up and have a long break until Norma's infusion depleted, making her take a short rest. Draco understood that what he had inherited wasn't a mere path or trade skill, but a revolutionary concept. Draco's eyes became red, and he regretted consuming Norma immensely. Such a genius. Why had she been forced to suffer like this? So what if she had been a bit insufferable? Which genius didn't have weird or annoying quirks in human history? How could the origin gods stand to trick her and kill her? Had the lack of any vacation turned them all into brainless fools? Had they made any calculations of how likely it was that a successor would appear in the future? If someone like Draco hadn't shown up, this amazing trade skill would have likely never seen the light of day again. Draco was a reincarnator with an overpowered bloodline, vast knowledge he had retained from the previous life, great tools at his beck and call, the ability to improve even further as his subjective magic could prove to anyone and even tier four control. All of these things had played a role in him being the ideal candidate to take on her inheritance. Had those retarded origin gods actually foreseen his appearance or had they just flipped a coin on whether to get rid of Norma? The chances of him appearing had been practically non-existent. Just look at his lineup. Did it seem likely that the AI would actually spawn someone like him as an NPC? Draco now understood why Norma had been so speechless when he had told her his conclusion that they had killed her because she had been insufferable. She probably hadn't been as hurt as he thought. 
just dumbfounded at how stupid those at the top had been for taking such a risk. She must have acknowledged that those she had been looking up to help her would mostly likely cause her path to go waste if they were left in charge, and so had willingly helped Draco as long as he wouldn't help them. Draco himself had initially felt a bit bad about betraying the gifts Copernico and Dimitri had bestowed upon him, even if there had been strings attached. However, that lingering feeling burned away now as he shook his head. He solemnly swore to raise his beloved Rila properly and prevent that little sweetie from turning into an idiot like her compatriots. Should he fail, he would commit suicide with a napkin for his crimes. After settling down, Draco activated his newly acquired refinement trade skill. However, despite his expectations, there was no special secret realm or floating orb to assist him. In fact, nothing changed. He felt no different from before. Draco frowned and contemplated. Could it be that because the path was not complete, there were still flaws in the trade skill? If that were so, how was he supposed to go about it? Draco then brought out a common rank ore he kept in his inventory. It was something he normally would smash with Mjolnir and forcefully upgrade it so he could cut costs. Draco concentrated on the ore and activated his refinement trade skill again. Much to his chagrin, still nothing happened. No menus, no screens, nothing. Then Draco's eyes widened. Could it be that refinement was currently in the same state as his Abyssal Prime class? Recognized by the system but not supported by it. Meaning one would have to use and develop it manually? That would make sense given the facts he had learned so far. It was likely that Norma had compiled it into a trade skill just to make it easier for her inheritor to utilize it compared to them having to learn the raw details from scratch. Draco took a deep breath and calmed his beating heart. He then focused on the ore in his hand and inspected it carefully to the very smallest detail with his control. Once he got a grasp of its fundamental makeup, he commanded it to become an iron ore mentally without activating or invoking anything. Immediately, he felt the worldly energy in the area swarm into his hands and coat the item. Since Draco still had it under the scrutiny of his control, he watched the change happen in real time. This moment was crucial for Draco. For this very first transmutation, he had directly decided to witness the fundamental conversion at a level just above the atomic one. Seeing it just once allowed him to enter a world of enlightenment as he replayed the scenes of the last milliseconds over and over in his head. The fundamental change of an item's structure, element, and essence. What did it mean? An onlooker would say that item A has magically become item B. While the current him still largely agreed with that assessment, he found that there were nuances, very important nuances, hidden within the whole transmutation process. Draco sat like that, lost in his own thoughts for another three days before he came out of his trance. He had gained a newfound respect for Norma and her trade, as well as even more disdain for the origin gods who had almost been responsible for the disappearance of this trade skill. Norma, how did she come up with this? What did she experience to make her develop something to grand and impressive? How did she even begin? What inspired her? Draco found himself wanting to know more about the origin goddess who created this, but that was impossible for now. However, he had his own means to bring her back in the future. For now, though, he dusted himself off and went to the center of the workroom where he found an orb floating that had not been there before. He instantly recognized it as the world core of this small world. Draco pulled out the deed to the small world and activated it. Instantly, a strange energy infused his body and a small resonance occurred between him and the small world in a more wholesome way compared to how he felt when he had first mimicked Norma's essence. Draco immediately used his newfound authority to close the opening in the Godmar Divine Empire. He would deal with them shortly before the time limit ran out, as they were the quest givers, but he had to take the treasury away and make some preparations beforehand. As soon as he did so, Draco used his bloodline to perform an apportation. While it wasn't as smooth as the ones handled by the system, Draco made sure to be as precise as he could, and he was helped by his void of perfection. Within it, apportation was actually quite easy for him. Even though he could go further with his bloodline, he didn't know what kind of mishap could occur due to a lack of control, 
so he decided to experiment another time. He appeared at the entrance of the palace and saw a troubled Vishad and Hoover who were surrounded by other mayors with dangerous expressions. The two fellows were currently moving their tongues in eloquence in order to preserve their lives, but the other mayors were losing patience. Once Draco appeared, all eyes fell on his form. Vishad and Hoover displayed relief and curiosity while the other mayors showed worry and defiance. Just as Draco was about to greet them, one of the most influential mayors came forth. Young friend Draco, it is good to see you are fine and well. I hope the inheritance of the Supreme Ancestor could be passed on to a person of her lineage, as I feel that would tie better with the wishes of our Supreme Ancestor. What do you think, fine fellow? The mayor spoke respectfully and eloquently. The other mayor stood forth and said similar things just as respectfully. Force? Threats? How could they behave like three-year-olds when he was likely their ancestor's chosen inheritor? For a politician to resort to such things first showed that one was unskilled, uncouth, and truly just useless. Instead, they had a few other ways to get Draco into giving up the inheritance without leaving any bad blood between them. However, against a fellow who was a psychic, such plans and considerat ions were nothing at all. Unless one had ways to lock their minds, their every thought would remain at his purview. In this case, their greeting amused Draco greatly. No, I will keep it because I've taken a liking to it, and because the refinement goddess had made me her inheritor. Anyone who disagrees with her is hereby banished from her lineage permanently, with no hope of reconciliation. Chapter 480 Universe Seedling the old mayors were stunned by this move. He had bluntly told them that he wouldn't share it, and in the same breath, he had single-handedly declared that attempting to make him do so would a terrible punishment. They all shivered inwardly when they imagined a life as an outcast. It was truly a fate worse than death in this small world, especially for them, so they all took a step back. Ha ha! Young Master Draco, there is no need for such things. We were merely trying to do what we felt would be best for our people. One mayor justified their behavior as he hastily wiped his face. The mayor who had stood out appeared to be the least intimidated, though, as he had been entrenched in power for a long time. He smiled thinly and spoke in a light tone. However, I think it is too much to deem such a punishment necessary. While I understand that you are likely the inheritor of our supreme ancestor, that is just that, an inheritor. He smiled even wider as he continued. We recognize your authority and that some of your words and actions may reflect the Supreme Ancestor's wishes, but it remains a fact that you are not our Supreme Ancestor. Not to mention, as the Supreme Ancestor's only descendants, the last thing their esteemed self would want would be to lose one of us for such a meager reason. Usually, such punishment is doled out only when an unforgivable crime had been committed. The mayor then bowed respectfully. Of course, I do not mean any offense or to challenge you in any way. I just feel that such tyrannical actions might hamper your relations with the populace if repeated often. This was a fellow who had clearly placed all points into charisma and maxed out his speech techniques. He had told Draco many things in just a few short sentences, a lot of advice, a concession, a warning, two threats, and a plea. Draco had to admit he had been impressed. This fellow would make a great diplomat for Vita City State and would work well under Sublime. He deserved to be cut some slack due to his talent, and Draco agreed that a better method could be used here. As such, he used Species Shift to emulate Norma's source origin and increased the output. To him, his resonance with the Treasury simply increased, and his connection to many things here grew exponentially. To the mayors before him, it was as if Draco had transformed into the refinement god spirit that they had seen just seven days ago, only much more intense. Their faces changed a great number of times, yet none of them hesitated to kneel in obeisance. Their love and loyalty to their supreme ancestor were paramount to anything else. Draco smiled with satisfaction. You see this, Norma? You've hardly paid attention to these folks, yet they still love and revere you unconditionally, even after all this time. Your life was tough, but you were never alone. The refinement goddess, your supreme ancestor, the great lady Norma, has bestowed everything to me. And I do mean everything. 
For all intents and purposes, I am not just her inheritor, I am more like a reincarnation or a copy of her. Draco shook his head. No, a better term would be that I am a perfect progeny of her life, essence, and trade skill path. Do you all understand? As politicians, how could they not? Their supreme ancestor likely no longer existed, having put her everything into her chosen inheritor, even her life essence. In this case, Draco was not merely an inheritor, but as he had stated, her number one progeny. Ultimately, this meant that Draco was no different from the supreme ancestor themselves. As such, the mayors kowtowed three times while loudly shouting, We greet the new supreme ancestor. Draco nodded and allowed them to rise. Also, no need to call me the supreme ancestor. Just continue calling me as you did previously. Any objections? The mayors acquiesced quickly. In truth, calling such a young fellow supreme ancestor felt quite weird. But luckily, Draco was thoughtful enough to sort out this issue before it became worse. Now I need you to err. A turn to your villages and inform our people about the incoming changes. Soon, I will be refining this small world and will take you all out. You will become citizens of my own kingdom in the outside world and many accommodations will need to be made. I trust I can rely on you all? The mayors nodded and made hefty promises in light of Draco's question. Draco himself nodded and waved them away as they all left hastily. Vishad and Hoover stayed for a bit hesitant about how to go forth. Things had gone out of their reach now. They had hoped for an inheritor who could back them among the various races, but what had come out was a person who was no different from their supreme ancestor themselves. As such, they didn't even know how to relate to him anymore. As for Draco, he could easily see through their problems and chuckled with amusement. He approached the duo slowly. Vishad, I need you to do the same for your people. Once outside Evergreen Village shall be treated as the capital of this small world and will be given an equivalent position when integrated into my kingdom. Vishad shuddered with excitement when he heard this. It had been every mayor's dream to be above their compatriots, yet Draco had exceeded such a simple wish by such a large margin the lizardmen had become speechless. He bowed low to Draco and thanked him profusely before rushing back to Evergreen Village to spread the good news. Draco then turned to the Goatman butler. As for you, Hoover, your duties haven't changed. You shall serve as the head butler for my entire estate. I expect great things from you. Hoover also shook and was grateful. Being a steward of a mere manor, meant for outsiders, and being the personal butler for Draco's clan were two seriously different things. They couldn't even be compared on the same wavelength. Hoover only knew the tip of the iceberg about the Morningstar clan. He just assumed that since Draco was so great, it was likely that the clan was also excellent. However, it was far beyond his comprehension. In the future, he would often look back to this day and feel shy that his response had been so exaggerated when he had known almost nothing. After sorting those two out, Draco sent a telepathic message to Clarent and Cheong Chi, telling them to stand back and stand by. The duo, who had, had been about to unleash the Armageddon of thefts, were dissatisfied with Draco's message, but going against his wishes would not be worth it. Naturally, they had cursed him the entire time in their thoughts while they went to retrieve all the advanced spatial creation devices they had planted around the treasury. When they had spent all that time roaming the intersection, they hadn't been doing so for fun. Draco's backup plan, in case he would have miraculously failed to get the inheritance, was simple. If he couldn't have it legally, he would have it illegally. He and his two evil buddies had intended to rob Norma of her descendants, resources, and everything else before fleeing like dogs. Fortunately, that was now unnecessary. Draco teleported towards the edge of the core section, precisely the area where he had handled his rank up. There, he saw what he had hoped to see and which got his blood pumping. It was the wall of impure origin energy that had prevented others from entering the core section until the time Norma's ghost opened it for the test. Just to be safe, Draco had left that one open. Draco smiled and placed his hand against the wall of impure origin energy, making sure to maintain Norma's source origin. Even though it was only an emulation and wouldn't allow him to generate or even store origin energy, he still could use it to control the energy itself. Like that, 
Draco condensed the barrier of impure origin energy that covered that entire space like a dome into a small origin crystal. Even though it had previously been impure, after condensation to crystal form, it became pristine as the one he had received from the legacy chest. This meant that Norma had literally chucked out an origin crystal and used to energy to form a barrier. Had Draco not known about the refinement trade skill, he would have believed that Norma was a rich wastrel, but now he knew that origin energy had been that hard for her to acquire. As a semi-origin god, she could get whole crystals full of origin energy to even use on external matters. One shouldn't forget, the qualification to become semi-origin was to be a true god with an iota of origin energy within oneself. This was the stage even Hikari's dragon god father had been at. Compared to Norma, he had been like a pauper to a prince, yet the dragon god had been far more feared and revered. Draco shook his head and took out the Etzheim seedling one. He then placed it next to the origin crystal, and as he expected, a system prompt appeared. While Draco felt confident he could do it manually, he knew the AI that favored him would bend the rules a bit to make things smoother. System to player announcement detected origin energy source and unique item receptacle. It is possible to fuse both items and increase the potential and power of the latter greatly. Proceed, YN. Draco naturally chose yes. In the next moment, the origin crystal and seedling floated away from his palms and hovered in the air above him. Lights flashed in the air as the origin energy from the crystals flowed out like thunder into the seedling that began to spin crazily. It shook and reverberated greatly during the process, and it felt less like a fusion and more like Draco was trying to create a forbidden weapon that could rend the world in its entirety. From a certain point of view, this wasn't exactly wrong. Soon enough, the light show came to an end, and a glowing Etzheim seedling fell into Draco Palm. Even without looking too deeply, he could tell that the item he was holding now was fundamentally different from the one he had been holding just a few minutes ago. Whether it was the look or feel it gave, they were vastly different. Draco held it up to eye level and then decided to inspect its details before deciding what to do next. Universal Seedling, Consumable Rank Effect allows one to grow a sprout of the universe tree within them opening the foundation of an internal super-mini small universe. Draco's hand shook. What he had done was just imbue this seedling with a bit of origin energy with the help of the system, but what he got out of it was something he had never even dared to dream about. He had expected his world tree to produce the highest quality life force and fruits, as well as have infinite growth potential. That way, he could use it as a base world to keep the members of his Morningstar clan close by whenever he wanted to move out, something like an idyllic resort planet from sci-fi movies. Now what he held was something greater than that, the foundation of an entire universe. For reference, the entire Western fantasy section counted as a universe. Each section of the game was its own universe, and Draco had literally received an item that would allow him to create his own section within a section. No, since he could leave Western fantasy and have the universe fused within himself, he would become his own section, a section that could pass through all others and take bits and pieces of them to strengthen itself, creating the ultimate universe. Draco wasted no time before choosing to fuse the seedling with himself. Who knew if an origin god saw him in passing and quickly snatched away the seedling? Would he even be able to cry then? System to player announcement detected fusion item. A merger would be performed in order to validate ownership. Proceed, YN. Draco hurriedly chose yes, and his face twisted greatly when he felt the seedling zoom from his palm and strike into his body right through his reverse scale. The pain made Draco scream like a little girl as he panted and released volumes of sweat. Author's Note 1 as my second novel, Darius Supreme, has been officially launched on various platforms, I have decided to take a, oh, knee-week break from Guild Wars to build a stockpile for it. This new novel features a more interesting plot than this one, and all lessons I learned and mistakes made with Guild Wars have knee-channeled to make Darius Supreme well, supreme. Once I return from the one-week break, 20 more chapters will be added once a day till we reach 500, 
where there will be an official hiatus for Guild Wars indefinitely. The novel will not be dropped, but the priority between it and Daroa Supreme will be switched. I hope you all can understand this choice I've made, as this novel has long lost its steam due to backlash over the first 30 chapters, and especially chapter 30. Thank you. Etz Chime Seedling, Consumable Rank, Epic, 100% Effectiveness. Effect allows one to grow a sprout of the world tree within them, opening the foundation of an internal super mini small world. Docs.googledom slash docdom when brand swope for p nibs p edit.